Okay, we're live. Welcome to another edition of In Class with Dr. Gray Carr. I'm Karen Hunter, of course, your host. And we already started class before y'all got here. So sure did. Sure did. We, we were trying to hold back. <laughs> well, you try to hold me back because I was just said, no, no. Oh my God. All right. Well, you this morning, sit. I am afternoon, morning. It's morning somewhere. It's afternoon and evening. Uh, and let me say hello to everyone who's in here from Toronto to Saudi Arabia to Nebraska to St. Louis. People got in here at 9 41 a.m. Eastern into wow. the chat. I was like, okay, let me just come in and say hello in the chat room. Uh hey, yeah, this everybody. <laughs> It's good to see y'all. Good to be seen as old folks saying, not viewed. <laughs> we were, we were going to do Anna Hegeman, but that's not yeah. going to happen today. <laughs> yeah, we were, I, Anna's sitting over there looking at me like, really, bro? I'm like, <laughs> this, you, you got, you, we, you need to do multiple days. Plus, there's all kind of things that have come out. In fact, Karen, I know we were supposed to do Makeda, the Queen of Sheba, some time ago. But in the meantime, I just picked up this little thing. There's a number of these little volumes by Ohio University Press. And their partner in South Africa called the Short Histories of Africa. This one uh, came out uh, in the last couple of months by Nwando Achebe called Female Monarchs and Merchant Queens in Africa. Wow. This is a very inex these are very inexp in inexpensive volumes. Um, I'm looking over here. Most of the ones I have, I, I got I got the first ones when I was in South Africa, but their partner is Ohio University Press. And these are like they're under twenty dollars, sixteen, seventeen dollars. But she goes through a nice see the table of contents. She goes through a nice discussion of women throughout African history. So I said, you know what? We, we'll get Anna paired up with some of these sisters and get the momentum running. So I mean, I, I just got that a couple of days ago. So this morning, um, this afternoon, what's what's on your mind? Sis? Oh no, I mean, I you know I watched. Um, we were talking last night uh, via text about uh, Ma Rainey. Yeah. And we were also talking about Stephen Biko. So we're going to have a, a chat about that. But, you know, I watched uh, on the heels of George Wolf's uh, interview that I did with him uh, this week. I was not going to watch it because it was going to make me sad to watch Chadwick Boseman. Mm. And, and, you know, because I couldn't stop looking at him knowing that, you know, shortly thereafter he wasn't here anymore. And so but George Wolf inspired me to watch it. And I'm glad I did. You know, of course, I saw it when it was on Broadway um, so many years ago, starring Whoopi Goldberg. You did. Yeah, I watched it on Broadway. Oh, well, Whoopi played. Uh, Whoopi played uh, Matt Rainey. Rainey. Yeah, he was the second major figure to kind of. But you know, uh, Teresa Merritt. Oh, she was the one who brought it to life the first time. Yale rep, and then that's my mama, right? That's my mama. Oh, exactly. See, some see, it's some people out there who kind of know exactly what. And of course, Charles Dutton is the one who made the the, the Bozeman character uh, Levy really brought him to life. So when I think of my Rainey's Black Bottom, I think of, of Dutton. But uh, but you saw Whoopi on Broadway. Yeah, Whoopi Anthony Mackie played the stuttering nephew. Uh, oh yeah, I remember y'all y'all were talking about that. Is that yeah. that's the one where your girlfriend brought the eight month old? No, that was bringing the noise, bringing the funk. Oh, bringing the noise, bringing the funk. Right, Savon Glover. That's yeah, right. Yeah, and the baby yeah. stayed quiet the whole time. The power oh, of black goodness. performance. Oh, the power of the drums. You know, but oh, I was yeah. watching. I was watching Ma Rainey. You know, and it was personal because you know, as it, for for a lot of reasons, nineteen twenty seven. You think about black people in 1927 and, you know, after that, there was 1919 Red Summer. You had Tulsa, Oklahoma. You had Rosewood. You had you had all of these decimations of communities. Ma Rainey rises up during this time. I'm also thinking about Moms Mabley. I'm thinking about yeah. Josephine. I'm like, I'm thinking about all of these black women who either were on their knees or on their backs. Those are the only two ways you could make a living in this country. And these women somehow found a way through entertainment, through vaudeville, through through these spaces, these backwoods places where folks like Elvis Presley would sneak off to to watch us. Ha, to, Tupelo, to Mississippi's Elvis yeah. Aaron Presley. <laughs> yes, indeed. You know, and, and I was thinking about um, Ma Rainey because Bessie, Queen Latifah's Bessie, you know, mm -hmm. Monique played her. Yes. And, and you think, and we were talking off mic just like minutes before we got on, I was like, I know Ma Rainey through Bessie, but Ma Rainey was mm. the, was the progenitor. You actually recorded before Ma Rainey. She was the one that Bessie actually brought from, and white people bestowed that on Bess. Like what? Yeah. So again, you know, like our heroes and our figures in history are oftentimes given to us. Madam C.J. Walker, not Annie Malone. You know, even though there's that. no there's no Madam C.J. Walker without Annie Malone, and Annie Malone was a millionaire first, but the narrative 
gets woven and then given to us. And then that's what we know. We know Bessie, but we, there's, um, I think George Wolf said there were hundreds of pictures of Bessie. He could only find seven pictures of Ma Rainey, seven images of Ma Rainey, who, if we watch Viola's depiction of her, oh my God. And then I was also thinking yeah. about the betrayal, you know, of having people in your own camp who watch what you do every day, because that's personal for me, you know, watch what you do every day and then have the audacity to go behind your back. That has happened so many times in my career and even recently oh, no question. where you have to make some tough decisions, you know, and do it with dignity, do it with silence, do it in a way that it doesn't, you know, uh, destroy the people who are actually doing it, which is a tightrope. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, the goal is not to destroy. The goal is to banish them so that they can't hurt you anymore. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, and then watching Levy with his background, you know, and understanding the pain that he came up through to just want to be a man with agency, but you're watching a woman with agency. So I'm going to take everything she has, you know, I'm going to take everything she has, you know, so I was, I was watching it through many different lenses. Uh, but the, the 1927 thing struck me because it's, uh, it's a particular time in history for black people. There was a, the first great migration. Uh, which we don't talk enough about. We talk about the second one, the one that brought my father's people up to Newark, you know, where my father that? was born, you know, and and you and you know that there's something else going on in the waters that August Wilson brought to life. And also August Wilson, who learned everything in the library, right? We've talked about this before on these airwaves. Yeah, we have. I imagine these 10 plays were rabbit holes that he went down. No question. He covered this. And then he wanted to tell the story of something in one day about something much bigger than my rainy. And that was oh, what no was question. powerful too. So I just, just wanted to frame it. And that's uh no. And, and, and uh, for everybody who's joining us, as we said, as, as, as uh, Karen opened up, as professor Hunter opened up, thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, Folks, I got my mic. Can you see it's a little bit off camera right there? You see that microphone? I got my little microphone. Y'all see in a minute. I ain't sure she, she she got it to me. So now hopefully the sound, my sound quality is a little bit more even. And uh, and I just use that as a metaphor because we move week by week, and the rhythm gets more and more clear. And so the conversation that we're having continues to develop more into a, a conversation and as folks are joining us and you know it, it's kind of narrated at least as narrated initially as question and answer but it's really conversation as you see we do week to week to week and and um as would be the case in your classroom uh karen and mine and really most teachers we enter the space with the rhythm of the time that has elapsed between the last time we were there. So uh, in the week since we were together, uh, we see, um, and I'm very much encouraged again by Donald Trump and his crew of white nationalists, they're trying to hold on. I mean, it's natural for any living thing, any organism to try to fight to survive. And so when, uh, when Trump announced this 1776 commission, <laughs> This last minute 1776 commission with no educators of any note, but, uh, you know, some of his buddies on there, some of these real, uh, I was looking to see, uh, you got the, um, the governor of Mississippi is on there, Charlie Kirk. And I won't name them cause they're all, you know, they'll all be forgotten by history. But, uh, but I, I took my cat because they're desperate now. And, there are two things that came to mind. And we were talking about this, for those of you who don't know where that came from out of left field. It didn't really come out of left field. I'm thinking about the way that you, 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 you've you opened up and began to discuss narrative. How do we frame a story? And why are certain things, do we consider them important? Like who was the first? Uh, why do we consider certain things important? Like uh, wh why didn't you include us? This kind of thing. And those kind of questions speak to a deeper question. And this is the question that you raised with me. We were texting back and forth. You raised me. Why is it important? And, you know, we know Bessie Smith in some ways because she, and to think about the our, our curriculum framework, the, the, the Africana States curriculum framework, those six conceptual categories that we developed. You know, once again, the first two were social structure and governance. 
the social structure question, when we enter any subject of study, we're thinking about framing things from Africana State's perspective. The social structure question asks, who are Africans to other people? We start with that question, not because it's more important, but because that is the thing we receive a steady diet of. So why are we fighting over dates on a number line that is arguably uh, arbitrary? Why are we fighting over 1619 versus 1776 when both those numbers are anchored in one particular religious uh, faith tradition that is predated by all of human history until yesterday? But and then every anything that happened before that zero or that one, ostensibly the birth of Christ, is considered B.C. And then, you know, and of course, they're laughing in China and indigenous peoples. And but they say, OK, fine. What would you say? was well, 2020. No problem, because we got to do business. But at home, y'all know that number is not. And of course, the Muslims like, yeah, no, nah, we're going to start with Muhammad. But OK, we, we do a business. So, yes, yeah, 2020. But my point is, while we fight over these arbitrary numbers, except that in the modern world that we live in framing who comes first often is a proxy or a stand-in for who has the center who occupies the center who has the power or authority even if only in the story so you know who comes Wait, first becomes can, can, can you pause there can you pause there for a second because of course this conversation this is the beauty of it yeah i, I got my mic i'm, I'm so excited <laughs> go ahead I don't think I contemplated until you just said this, that 2020 this year is a, not a real thing either. Oh. Until you just said it, it is an agreed upon. Or forced I, upon. And then it's just easier to say it. So when did that happen? Like, when did it, when, when did folk determine that I'm going to, I'm going to say this is the first year of our Lord. Year oh, one. Yeah. Well, that you just said it. Anno Domini, that's Latin. It's the Catholic Church. Mm. But it's the Catholic Church in partnership with the expanding nation, with the, expa the expanding polities that form into the nation states of Europe. And that's a whole nother comment. I now I'm thinking about my man, John Henry Clark, who sent me when I was uh, in my early 20s, man, searching on my hands and knees for, uh, there's a book by Alvin Boyd Kuhn. There's this crew of like British and American kind of esotericists who are writing in the late 19th, early 20th centuries who are attempting to puzzle out the history of humanity using what uh, one of them, Albert Churchward, uh, called British the signs and symbols of primordial man. So they're looking back through time and space for signs and symbols. And what does this mean? So, you know, by now they've cracked the code on hieroglyphs in the 1820s and 30s. So, you know, the Egyptians, they're no longer looking at these symbols, the, the Europeans and, and trying to puzzle out esoteric meaning, but they're still assigning these underlying meanings. Now this is gonna be around the same time, by the time you get into the 20th century, in the emergent, uh, with the emergence of, you know, Freud and Jung and the unconscious and the idea of these motivating factors beyond the symbols that human beings create. In fact, um, there's a book, and I would be hard pressed to find it now. That is one of the books I have around here in Nine in Storage uh, that it, 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 it explores, Freud explores Freud's home and his desk, his working desk is littered with Egyptian statuettes and, uh, and and little objects that are taken from ancient Egypt because he's fascinated with. In fact, he wrote a book called Moses and Monotheism. That's a whole nother story for another day. Let me let me not get too far afield in the footnotes. Come back to the narrative. In that late nineteenth, early twentieth century, one of the great American disciples of these British Britishers who were writing, you know, you got Gerald Massey, you've got uh, Albert Churchward, and then you've got this American named Alvin Boyd Kuhn, K U H N. And John Henry Clark used to always talk about this book. Uh, who is this king of glory? And then he also talked uh, talk about another book that Kuhn wrote called The Shadow of the Third Century. Well, you know, I went looking for him. And I found, you know, I've got them over here somewhere you know, over there in the corner. But these book, Kuhn is exploring the origins of the Christ story. And there's others, uh, Kelsey Graves book, The World 16's Crucified Saviors. These are the kind of books that black folks in these study groups and out of black bookstores got reprinted over the years. And in fact, uh, you know, it was a place out of Brooklyn that was reprinting for the years. Fortunately, this was before the internet blew up many, many years ago. So I was able to find copies, you know, the originals. But, and, and, and I realized that Dr. Clark, who had started reading this literature in the 1930s, when he came to New York, 1933, was greatly influenced by, among others, uh, John Glover Jackson out of South Carolina, who was in New York at the time. 
And, and John G. Jackson, these guys, they had study groups. Uh, when we get to Anna Hedgeman, we're going to talk about her working at the YWCA in Harlem on 137th Street. But then there's also the YMCA, and they were meeting in the basement of the YMCA, and they called it the Edward Blyden Society. And we kind of know it also as the old Harlem History Club, as Dr. Clark would call it. And this is at the time Arturo Schomburg is operating down the street at the, at the Negro branch of the New York Public Library that would eventually bear his name. Um, and they're reading all this stuff, trying to puzzle out. In fact, uh, uh, Jackson gives a talk, was Jesus Christ a Negro? Because they're looking for the racial origins in part as a way to use history as a weapon to push back against white supremacy. So they're also looking for the origins of the Christ story, which they plant in Africa. But along the way, they begin to uncover the roots of this kind of use of dating to establish this historiographical framework. So in the shadow of the third century, the book is about, Kuhn's book is about Constantine, which of course, you know, there are libraries of books on the, the uh, ecumenical councils when, you know, the Romans get together and the Roman emperor gets, you know, Constantine is there and they're gonna decide the authoritative book that they're gonna use as the Bible, which books which go, books go in, which books don't go in. This is the uh, Council of Nicaea, I think 330, you know, that's, uh, Three, it comes to me in a minute. Early, it's, the, it's like the 330s, um, 332, but I say 332, but in my mind, 332, I associate with Alexander of Macedon, so called great. But at any rate, this is on the so called AD side. But once they establish they're going to make Christianity the official religion of the state, meaning the Roman Empire, then the empire's dating system will eventually passed down through time and space through various permutations, the, the, the calendrical you know, structure that they set up eventually to be uh, the, what they call the Gregorian calendar, right? And with interventions by, by Roman emperors like Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar, which is, which is why we have a July and an August in the calendar. All these things get formed around the 12 month calendar of roughly speaking 30 days each, which has handed down from antiquity. The Egyptians had a 12 month calendar, but they had they had a 12 month calendar of 30 days each. And at the end of that cycle, in fact, we're entering it right now. Oh my goodness, today's the 19th. We're in the solstice period. The solstice period, what the Egyptians would do is they had a, they had a concept of a great year. They had a concept, in other words, to say that, you know, roughly speaking, time over a 12 month period will be kind of parceled into 365 and a quarter days. We're going to take that five and a quarter off the end, make 30 days a piece. And then that five and a quarter, we're just going to accumulate until we get 360, at which point that will become the leap year. That's how far in time and space the Egyptians were thinking once they structured the calendar based on observing uh, astronomical phenomena. This isn't esoteric. This isn't beliefs. This is purebred science the Egyptians have. But the names and the numbers we get, all oh, that's faith stuff. All oh, that's you know, all oh, that's human conjuring, trying to tell, put a narrative on time. So you're telling me that uh, a group of people who were scientifically superior, scientifically rooted and grounded, mm -hmm. had a system that was near perfect for charting the course of time. Sure. And a group of people came after them. Long after them. A poor facsimile of that original group. Mm -hmm and decided we're gonna throw all that out. We're gonna start with this date and then we're gonna take the time to go back and basically erase and call that BC. Yeah. Well, to this day, this is what, and now we got this Trump debacle. <laughs> this, 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 I don't even wanna call no, him no, names. No, but, no. You know, we got this entity with the audacity to, to, to come forward and, and reframe our entire American history and then put a council together on his way out to yeah. make sure that we codify this lie in our school system. Again, another well, lie. Well, well, you were not that, see what you just did. You just introduced all the elements for an explosion. What did Malcolm say? As long as you have the ingredients for an explosion, you have the potential for explosion on your hands. You just, you just named them all. Just because they say it don't mean we believe it. However, if you have control of the social structure, the education system, uh, dollars, you know, resources that can go into supporting this kind of thing, you can certainly attack or attempt to shape the minds of the people who live in your society, particularly the young people. We all came up in the same system. 
So we know, of course, the old phrase that you, you, we all learned as children in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean, ocean blue. Where they go the number and there goes Columbus and there goes the indoctrination. It brings us in and people have to literally fight their way into history. This reminds me of an old phrase my my Jegna or Jegna Jacob Carruthers used to say in Chicago. You know, we trying to we had to fight our way into history. John Henry Clark used to say we had to fight our way into history. Why? Because history as a narrative has been stated, put on the end of a gun barrel, and put in your mouth. <laughs> now repeat after me. <laughs> in other words, this 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 thing, this was not something we uh, we assented to. This is something we were forced into, drawn into through the enslavement process, through colonialism, and even in Africa when Ayikwe Arma writes in The Eloquence of the Scribes, how, you know, he coming out of the village, coming out of the history that he learned, and they sent him to the school. Next thing you know, I'm in the school, and they teach me that, you know, uh, there is no literature but European literature, and Shakespeare is the prophet. So therefore, repeat after me. In other words, this, 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 this orienting time and space allows people to impose their concept of the world on other people. That doesn't make it bad or good in every culture has its way of viewing reality and so between rome and classical africa so to speak and even classical is a term we start talking about classical medieval and modern these are these are labels we Im we impose on time and space that can also threaten to put us in straight jackets that we can't escape from you know, it, it, time is cyclical. Time has cycles. And it we think of it as strictly linear in part because of the way that these worldviews have been imposed on us. And then we, conforming to those worldviews, uh, began to try to be first in line. But anyway, I'll co come at it in a second because Ma Rainey, we haven't left Ma Rainey. We're actually going to tie this all together in Ma Rainey in a second. Um, so between the, Ro the Roman Empire, which rises, and the kind of long life and then kind of decline of Northeast Africa, whether you talk about uh, Kush, Nubia, uh, where you start talking about Kemet or Egypt, what we call old Ethiopia, that whole corridor of the Nile Valley, which stretches all the way into deeper inner Africa and then moves down the Nile. And I'm saying down going this way because the Mediterranean up here on the map we use, but the Nile River source is in inner Africa near the equator. So it runs and it meets up in the Sudan from Ethiopia, Blue Nile, White Nile, Uganda meets up and then empties out. That whole corridor, that whole Nile Valley corridor, which we mentioned back uh, early in the summer, we talking about Bruce uh, Bruce Adams' book, uh, Bruce Yawalde Adams' Nubia Corridor to Africa, and so many others. In fact, um, the guy who was um, I was just looking at that book again, just gave this series of lectures for uh, Henry Louis Gates. Yeah, here it is. Um, Charles Bonnet, uh, Black Kingdoms of the Nile. These are now about valley civilizations, but at any rate. But see, it's not like they are supplanted in uh, this vicious act of uh, global historical warfare by Europe. There is no Europe. There are people in contact with each other. What Bruce Trigger in his work used to call tri-continental antiquity. You had Africa, you got what we will call Europe. And then we got that curve over there on the other side that they now call the Middle East. All that stuff's in conversation with each other. So you got the Hittites. You got, I mean, all that stuff, those people who are Christians going to Old Testament, all them names, you see all them labels. Those people are all in contact with each other. You know, Egypt gets a bad rap because they so old by the time these people come along who want to make up a history for themselves. Everybody holding their head. I know we're in this season. We start talking about Bethlehem and all that kind of stuff. But these children of Israel, and I'm putting Israel in quotes because they ain't no Israel, is people who decide they're going to make up an origin story of their own. Now, you can look at the Egyptologist Jan Asman, who has written about this God God versus the gods, um, the birth of monotheism, all this kind of stuff. He talks about first order and second order religions. A first order religion, which in our curriculum uh, we wrote, that uh, that third category, ways of knowing, we said we can't use the word religion. How do people make sense of the world? People who tell stories about where do we come from? Who are we? How am I related to you? What, what is the nature of life? All those kind of things, these ways of knowing, what some people might call world sense or worldview. Jan Osman says that people who make those stories up create what he calls first order. And then if you're talking about religions, 
religious beliefs. He says, you know, you got first order religions. This is the way the world came into existence. The Yoruba people would say, you know, Oludumare creates the world. And then he this golden chain that comes down. And he, he drops out of heaven on the golden chain. He puts a little dirt on in the middle of the water of the deluge. And then as, as the mound breaks up, he drops a chicken on it and the chicken starts scratching. And that's where the earth came from. Okay, that's great. That's the Yoruba story. That's a first order story. Meaning what? We made that story up. Then Osman says, you have a category he calls uh, second order. Second order is people who didn't make the story up, who find themselves in contact with first order societies, first order traditions, either voluntary or involuntary. Think Joseph and his brothers. That's involuntary. Now you in Egypt. The Egyptian stories are first order stories. They made those up. Now you come in contact with them. Now, according to these people, if you read the first five books of the so-called Old Testament, again, these books are all ordered and put together. Uh, the Romans, you know, Constantine, this is the Council of Nicaea, and then the, the subsequent ecumenical councils, you know, anyway. You read those books and say, okay, we were there for, for 400 years. Now, there's no evidence in the Egyptian record been discovered yet of the presence of this group of people. And slaves, didn't, no, no, the pyramids, are made, I've been in them many times. Dr. Carson, brother. Stick to brain surgery. Those are not granaries. I understand the, the pyramids. I've been in them many times, dozens of times. The famous ones and the ones not so famous. You know, yeah, but at any rate, you know, first time I went was in tow with some of the great thinkers of African descent been in this country. Jacob Carruthers and Wade Nobles and Leonard Rosner Jeffries. You you name it. You know what I'm saying? You know, Asa Hilliard. All the man, that, that was 1996. Since then, been there, been back there many times, including last year with a bunch of Howard students, Mario Beatty leading that. The greatest student of Egyptian language, one of the greatest we have right now, you know, Riketty Wimby, uh, up there in the tri state area where you are, Karen, uh, in, in Fundishi Jehudi Mez. I mean, we got cats, you know, what I'm saying been in them places many times. They don't store grain, bro. Stick to the scalpel. Well, in a minute, it ain't gonna matter anyway because you're gonna fly off into that good night. Uh, but at any rate, the idea that these people built this stuff is pure fiction, but they gotta have an origin story. So what Osman would say is, this is a second order tradition. What is a second order tradition? A second order tradition, when surrounded by first order society, figures out how to create its own origin story. So when there's a moment to break with the first order society, either through escape or fighting their way out, they turn around and say, everything the first order society said was a lie. This is the founding moment. But here's the trick, as Osman relates, as it relates to this, these uh, so-called Abrahamic faith traditions that we deal with, Christianity, Jude, uh, Judaism first, Christianity second, Islam third. They're all second order traditions in terms of these original African traditions. Why? Because the first one itself comes out of a break with the first order traditions, particularly the Nile Valley traditions and tricontinental act antiquity. But here's the here's the trick. They say everything that came before this is a lie. This is the founding moment. But they keep many of the concepts from the first order tradition. They just rename them. So remember when Moses comes down the first time with the Ten Commandments, the people down there worshiping the golden calf, that's Hetheru, Hathor, that's the Egyptian. That's the symbolic representation of the first order. He said, oh no, heck no, smashes the tablets, goes back up, makes them drink the bitter water. In other words, we got to break. Everything the Egyptians said is a lie. Then he comes back down. These are the Ten Commandments. Commandment number one, you will have no other gods than me. The little kids in the audience must have said, there are other gods, mommy? Shh, Moses is talking. <laughs> you see, <laughs> so in other words, Wait, there's more than one guy? Be quiet. You know, children just blow the whole game because children don't know enough about narrative yet. They think there's an absolute truth in these stories. But anyway, the rest of those commandments, I, when you go to the Nile Valley, you're going to see them all over the Nile Valley. Don't kill. Don't rob. You stand at Patao Tep's tomb on the Sakara Plateau. Patao Tep going back to at least... 22, 2300 years before the birth of Christ is saying, no, you must treat people with respect. You must value your elders. You must go through, you know, you start seeing what they call, and this is what they call the uh, declarations of innocence 
the, you know, some of the papyrus, the judgment scenes, we've talked about that, the papyrus of I need so many others. In other words, the Ten Commandments are drawn from the first order traditions, but the people who frame them as the Ten Commandments cannot say that without connecting themselves to the first order traditions with unless they make a break, which is by the time by the time you get through Genesis, the origin stories in Genesis, those Egyptian origin stories. It is our moon, for although hidden is the source of all power. Life and health and speech creates the word Amun. Who is Amun? Amun is the Egyptian guy. You mean like Amen? Yeah. You mean like I mean in the Arabic? Yeah. But you can't say that. Why? Because I you know y'all going with y'all thing. Y'all didn't. Y'all didn't take that. Cultures bleed. As Cornel West often reminds us, cultures bleed. People talk to each other. We eating hot dogs and pizza now. We didn't bring that from Africa, but the way we put a little hot sauce on stuff, we brought that hot taste in our mouth from. No, everything bleeds. But how you narrate it can often be translated into power relationships. So here we are in 2020 in a world where we have a social structure, social structures we live in, who are the various peoples of the world to people outside their groups. And then you have the governance category. It's the second of our curriculum uh, questions. Who are these people to each other? Who are African people to each other? So let's shrink this back down, bring it back to my rainy because we haven't really left through Trump. Trump and them are engaged in a war that they don't realize they never won. The war was and is to define this social structure we're living in in a way where people buy in and believe it with their whole heart. So when you hear Paul Robeson singing the ballot for Americans during World War II, and you know, in 1776, so, hmm. oh wow, what are you doing? I'm Paul Robeson, I'm an African in America from Jersey, popped from, pop from North Carolina, escaped enslavement, you know, but in order to sell this thing that we all together, I'm gonna sing this song. Makes it very powerful. Comes along with another recording. What is America to me? And he's singing, what is America to me? A certain word, democracy, what is America to me? That's the open question. Then Robeson singing another man's lyric sells the thing by framing it the way we should think about it. The house I live in. It's the house I live in. America is the local identity. So Trump and them raging about 1776, black people were like, yo, uh, LeBron and them playing Christmas Day. You know, we're not thinking about, man, dude. Now, the problem, as you as you have identified, it comes in when the children go to school. Because now you're going to fill their mind with a narrative that they got to fight their way into history to be in. And then we have the beef. Now, the beef becomes, if first of all, if you believe it, which is a big but, if you ever, if you believe it, you're going to think you have to fight your way into it. Now, we ain't dealing with 1776. We're dealing with 1619. Why? Us too. Us to what? Us to in this project. What project? You know, America. Well, what is America? Well, what is America to me? The house I live in. Okay, that ain't my house. So how are we going to create a we? Well, not sure. And here's where, and I believe it was, uh, was it Baldwin or was it Ellison? It says, you know, what we do, kind of how we live, that's who we are. What we remember is who we would have liked to have been. Thus our identity and our memory are always at odds. In other words, so, so memory, the fight is over memory. This is where August Wilson comes in as we're gonna kind of fast forward this, skip over a lot of stuff, right? But it all works and flows together. August Wilson, you know, born Frederick Cottrell in Pittsburgh, father white, mother black. Um, Wilson, clearly born with a gift. Striving to find his way in the world. Drops out of high school, gets that education in the libraries in Pittsburgh, you know, goes in the army, comes back. Sister gives him a little money. He's around town trying to, you know, buys a typewriter. He says, you know, Wilson is like, and I, and believe me, and we talk, and folks, you want to go back, go back through the, uh, the in classes. You'll see a lot of this conversation we've had before. August Wilson is one of the great heroes of our struggle. But he's not alone. He's representative of a larger other group. We start talking about those other categories. Uh, after ways of knowing, we have science, technology. After that, we have cultural meaning making and movement and memory. 
Our artists often create memory for us that allows us to sit in who we are in that governance pocket, who we are to each other. That's outside of the social structure. We know who you think we are. We're not even worried about that. We know who we are to each other. Now, the problem comes in when those two categories get too close. There's an almost like an electric barrier there. And it's, it's, it's. so now Netflix going to show Ma Rain's Black Bottom, which is great. A movie was made offenses, which was great. But the idea that we can represent dimensions of African life in the United States in ways that translate what they would call universal, although I think that's hilarious. It's all, you know, some themes are universal. What does that mean? You know, like love and hate and fighting. Okay, well, if they're universal, how come every time you talk about them, you line up Romeo and Juliet and, and Beowulf and the Scarlet Letter, and then I gotta, when I come, you say, well, here comes August Wilson. He's like the American Shakespeare. Well, what, Shakespeare, you, huh? you're not, you're an American. I know, but Shakespeare is English, right? Yeah, but he's white. I mean, we got a master narrative, what Clyde Taylor would call a master narrative. I mean, you gotta fight your way into history. Wilson is like, I'm not interested in fighting my way into history. I'm interested in talking about what I heard, what I saw. What did you hear? What did you see in Pittsburgh, bro? August Wilson says this, and never forget. Wilson is like, you know, they told me to start. I was reading, I think it was Claude McKay's Home to Harlem, he says. And he says, I read about a place in Pittsburgh that I knew. Like a, a like a hangout, people used to go. I mean, it's been there that long yet. So I started going to the place, and I'm sitting there just listening to people. And, I, and one day, and these are old cats, brothers primarily. Asked me these dudes, and he said one day, he said, "Let me just ask this question." I thought about this when uh, you were talking to my friend and, and colleague Imani Imani Perry uh, the other day. He posted on YouTube. You haven't seen that conversation, you know? When you and Imani were talking about how do you get old people to talk. And Imani was like, you know, you ask them questions about other things, about children, how you raise children. You ask them about, you know, do you remember the thing you loved the most? And they start telling the stories, right? So Wilson asks a profound question. August Wilson asks, how you get to live to be 70 years old in America to a black man? you 70 years old. How'd you live to get to be 70 years old in America? August Wilson. I saw August Wilson the year he made transition, he came to Howard. He received an honorary degree. It was one of the highlights of my life. August Wilson was born April 27th, 1945. Uh, that's my birthday. Um, we share a birthday. Ma Rainey, by the way, was born April 26th. We'll come back to that in a second. But at any rate, earlier, much earlier, 19th century. But August Wilson was already sick with the cancer that was to take his life. Now, according to reports, he didn't get the diagnosis until June. This was early May, the Saturday before Mother's Day. August Wilson got up and he's talking like this, which he, he had a voice like that anyway. But now I'm wondering, wow, he was, he was already sick with the stuff. August Wilson, instead of saying, you know, this great thank you speech and this kind of thing, August Wilson, I'm going to read it to you. August Wilson stood up and gave the director's notes from my favorite August Wilson play, Joe Turner's Come and Gone. So these are these this is the setting for the play. By the way. August Wilson said he got up that day from the deep and near south, the sons and daughters of Newley. No, 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 I'm sorry. He started with this. I stand here. This was original line. I stand here in my grandfather's shoes. You could have heard a pin drop. Thousands of people would hear me. Beautiful day. And I stand here in my grandfather's shoes. It's August Wilson, man. And I thought about my grandfather, Thomas Hayes, Ju Thomas Hayes Sr., Alabama farmer. My mother's father. My father's father, Haskell Carr. East Tennessee farmer, you know, I stand here in my grandfather's shoes. And then he started talking. And as I heard the lines, I just dropped my head and smiled because I knew the notes at the beginning of what some people call his African play. Joe Turner's come and gone. I don't know how the hell they ever will bring this to movies. More on that in a second. From the deep in the near south, the sons and daughters of newly freed African slaves wander into the city. There's that migration you were talking about isolated, cut off from memory, having forgotten the names of the gods 
and only guessing at their faces. They lost their first order religion. We in Christianity now, that's the second order religion. Third, if you claim, well, we didn't spun on it. Unless you think about the fact we didn't Africanized it, which maybe makes it a first because we didn't go on back to what fed into Christianity and reclaimed it and put it back into Christianity. But we'll get back to that. He says, they arrive dazed and stunned, their heart kicking in their chest with a song worth singing. I was wasn't always talking about that song. I got a song. Levy got a song he's trying to get out. Ma got a song she's trying to get out. You ain't gonna mess with my song in this production studio. I understand about the tempo. I know what the young boy want to do, but we're gonna sing this way. I sing it in the tents. I sing it in the theaters. I got a song. August says, they arrive carrying Bibles and guitars. Their pockets lined with dust and fresh hope. Marked men and women seeking to escape from the narrow, crooked cobbles and the fiery blasts of the coke furnace a way of bludgeoning and shaping the malleable parts of themselves into a new identity as free men of definite and sincere worth. This dude, it's no joke. Wilson, let me talk about this in a second. I'm looking at the clock. I mean, we're going to keep this going. August Wilson emerges in that period, the 1950s and 60s, in a moment when African people in this country have some African people turn to a very deliberate exercise of remembering. We want to connect to the things that came before this settler colony. The things, some of them we never abandoned, we never got rid of, we never, you could never beat it out of us. These ways of knowing we've always had, but we've never quite known how to place or narrate them. We're looking for new narratives to connect us to very old ideas. And so Wilson tries his hand as a poet. For the better part of a decade, he's reading poetry, he's writing poetry. He publishes finally a poem, 1969, Negro Digest. Y'all can look that up, Google Books, Negro Digest, you, you can find it. Anyway, we talked about some of this stuff you know, earlier in class with Carl. But Wilson eventually finds his way to St. Paul, Minnesota. Now he's going to be a playwright. And he says in, in a couple of interviews, he says, you know, I wasn't going to, you know, spend as many years as I spent studying poetry, studying playwriting. I'm just going to try it. <laughs> he said, in fact, August Wilson, by the early 2000s, just before he makes transition, he, by the way, he makes transition in October 2005. I saw him in May. He was diagnosed in June. He's out of here by August, by, by, by October in terms of his physical form, but he, find, he gets into the pipeline of the workshop process he always had, the last play in his 10-play cycle, Radio Golf, which is set in Pittsburgh. All the plays set in Pittsburgh except one. Uh-oh. That's the one people going to tune in and watch. Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. That's Chicago. He's telling the local story, but he's using it to tell the African story. What is America to me? The house I live in. My neighbor is white and black. So, you know, when you hear Paul Robeson sing that version, and Frank Sinatra sang a version, and they used it in the HBO thing, The Plot Against America, that's cute. But man, when this brother Paul Robeson sings it, I know what he's talking about. I don't know Donald Trump. I have nothing in common. I don't care whether he's in Mar-a-Lago or jail. The house I live in is right here on Saturday. This is the house I live in. What is America to me? I got one answer for the social structure and another answer for the governance structure. And when those two things get close up to each other, you know the barrier between the social structure and the governance structure is often called in our communities? Irony. That's why black comedians are so important. This woman said one thing and black people heard one thing and you heard another thing. Why? Because you could say one thing and mean two different things. So you got to understand that we negotiate between that social structure and the governance structure. And we got to know the social structure. You don't know a damn thing about our governance structure. And part of that is because we don't want you to know. This is sacrosanct. In your mind, in your social structure, I wash clothes in your house. I scrub your floors. I do all that. But in my governance structure, I'm a deaconess. I am Bessie Smith, the empress of the blues. Yeah, I'm already the mother of the blues. And guess what? <laughs> Gertrude Ma Rainey from Columbus, Georgia. Gertrude Ma Rainey uh, was married to a dude named William Rainey. He was known as Pa Rainey. They toured together before uh, they split up. And she moved on to do a number of other things. They were known as Rainey and Rainey. Get their nickname, no. Get their nickname, uh, uh, Karen. The assassinators of the blues. <laughs> they toured with the Rabbit Foot Minstrels. 
I mean, it's crazy. Ma Rainey was born April 26, 1886 in Columbus, Georgia. Brothers and sisters, she ended up coming back to Columbus, Georgia. She recorded almost 100 songs in, in the 90s somewhere uh, between 1923 and 1928. There's a, there's a sister who predates her, who makes a recording in 1920. Bessie Smith becomes the kind of public face, and she's younger. She's kind of going to tap into that. But Ma Rainey made her money touring. Ma Rainey made the, you know, thing. Ma Rainey named Ma because she and her husband, she he was Pa, she was Ma. Now she on her own. In fact, Karen, you sent me back. Mm -mm -mm. This is our sister, Angela Yvonne Davis out of Birmingham, Alabama. Blues Legacies and Black Feminism. Gertrude, Ma Rainey, Bessie Smith, and Billie Holiday. It's an excellent book. What? This is that Angela Davis. Yes. What Angela Davis does, there she goes. There's Angela. Angela Yvonne Davis, our elder. She reads through all the lyrics, listens to all the music, and does this massive book dealing with this question of the blues. And she talks about black feminism, but she, she says, I'm not going to use black feminism in any rigid sense. I'm just kind of talking about women in this context. And the irony is, Paul Rainey not mentioned in this book. And I'm saying, ah, okay, this is a very valuable, very important, very necessary, brilliant text. And I'm still thinking, you know, we've got to come up with better language to deal with black social relations because these categories, whether it be race, whether it be class, whether it be gender, if we're thinking about human life, trying to separate in these categories and then recombine them, whether you want to call it intersectionality, we're going all the way around the barn. Can we look at life as it is lived and come up with language to help us express that? Otherwise, we will always have these categories which are setups for fighting. So, but but it's brilliant because what Angela Davis talks about is how Ma Rainey negotiates this terrain that she's in. You see, Ma Rainey, and of course, in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, we see uh you know, Levy pushing against this, and more importantly, in the there are very few white characters in August Wilson plays. By the way, two of them are in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. You got another sympathetic character in Joe Turner's Come and Gone, uh, who's also in Gem of the Ocean. Uh, but they're operating in this field of violence called America. Competition. Is capitalism good? Is capitalism bad? You know, people tend to think hypercapitalism is bad. Maybe even capitalism as a concept is bad. I, I, you know, I'm sympathetic to those arguments. At the same time, we understand that we are living in this field where you're under perpetual assault, where what we're doing, you know, might be considered some people. What y'all doing? What y'all just giving it away? OK, you're thinking in the idea of salable commodities. Everything ain't for sale, you know, so, except if people who are giving things away, people say, well, why are you doing that? Okay, you got to think about the social structure you're in. Ma Rainey is operating in a social structure as a real person, as was Bessie Smith, as was Billie Holiday, and Angela Davis is talking about all those things. They're operating in a real circumstance where being women, being black, puts them at a strict disadvantage in the social structure and in the governance structure, there are things that have, we picked up some terrible habits in here, but they got to negotiate that too, in terms of gender and, you know, social class and all those things you see at play in Wilson's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And so, uh, but what Wilson is fighting to do, but Wilson refuses not to do. He says, whatever story I'm going to tell is a black story. What is black? I'll let you figure that out. How do you fit? I'll let you figure that out. Why? Because I'm just going to tell the story that's here. And more importantly, that's here. I don't make up characters. I listen. And as I listen, I try to let them talk to each other. And I try to catch little bits of it on napkins and in my pad. And, you know, in my house in Seattle, I stand up at my writing desk and write. I got a punching bag set over here and I get a good line off. I'll give a few licks and I come back, write some more. Why? These are the things that are talking to me. I'm recovering, reclaiming memory. That's what he did at St. Paul in the Penumbra Theater where he uh, does his black, black bar, bad bar of the Black Hills early play. Then he sends off uh, Jitney. He sits, he says, I wrote Jitney in like 10 days. I said, you know, because I'm going to send off to this competition, this Eugene O'Neill competition back east. He sends it there. That's 1981. It's rejected. He says, they ain't read my shit. So he sends it again. It's rejected again. That's the same year. This brother, Woody King, still alive. You probably know Woody King. Woody King uh, put together a collection of essays in 1981 called Black Theater, Present Condition. In this book, Woody King is talking about the need for a black theater. 
He writes an essay called Bringing an End to the Theft of Black Art. And what Woody King says is, he says, uh, let me see if I can find it quickly, because you know, I don't I always mark in my books, particularly ones that are hard to find like this. He says, these people are pimping us. He says, if you find black people that made a dollar off of production in a white space, you can believe the white man made at least 10. He says, we got to bring an end to the theft of black art when our creative production has been monetized and then is out there. So, of course, I'm going you know, to watch my Rainey's Black Bottom and Netflix going to make a whole lot more money than any of the actors and actresses and any of the black people who worked on the thing. But that's just how it is in a field of violence that we're working on. That's the same issues being brought up in my Rainey's Black Bottom. He also ends the uh, ends this collection with Legacy of the Raising of the Sun, Hansberry's Children. He did a he did a book on black theater um he says three years ago not long after for colored girls who had considered suicide when the rainbow was enough opened when the black musicals on broadway were regarded as black theater i decided out of anger to make a documentary film on black theater not a book but a, a, a film he makes this film and it's called the black theater movement a raisin in the sun to the present he interviews all these black people all these black actors let me name a few of them Lonnie Elder. Yeah, I know Lonnie Elder the third. I, I was, I mean, I'm a theater major in Tennessee State. We we did ceremonies in dark old men. Lonnie Elder the third. Yeah, I played Mr. Parker, the, the lead role in that play. One of August Wilson's rough contemporaries, right? Lloyd Richards. We'll come back to Lloyd Richards. Douglas Turner Ward. Y'all heard Sty the Blind Pig. Another one of August Wilson's contemporary with Alice Childress and so many other numbers. There is a legion of black playwrights. But they're not taking the path that's going to lead them to the social structure of Broadway. They're fighting to stage their thing. Sometimes it's a case of uh, Barack and them, Bart, you know, like our repertory theater with first in New York, then in Newark. They just going to put it in the street. Jimmy Garrett, we own the night during the Black Studies movement out there in, in the West Coast. They just going to put up a sheet and stage and do it on the street. Of course, uh, the sister uh, Barbara Ann Tier, uh, you know, of course, right there in Harlem, right? National Black Art uh, Theater, they, they, they National Black Theater. They're going to do the thing in Chicago. Abner Joan uh, Walker. I mean, I'm just thinking about all these black playwrights doing this stuff. Uh, the Free Southern Theater. Um, oh, my goodness. What's my man's name? Neil, 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 John Neil. All these people, they're doing all this. And then, of course, they're the HBCUs, the National Association for Dramatic and Speech Arts. Oh, don't get me started. Don't get me started. This is a book. This is impossible to find. Y'all even look for this. This is the history of the uh, National Association of Dramatic and Speech Arts. That's the HBCU theater companies. But Wilson, so when we see August Wilson, he's not an outlier. He's part of a governance structure of meaning makers, of memory keepers, of black playwrights doing ways of knowing who are in that governance structure who the social structure don't know nothing about. But Wilson broke through. Why does Wilson break through? Because as Lonnie Elder is talking about in Legacy of the Raisin in the Sun, who directed a raisin in the sun because when August Wilson's play opens, jo uh, not Joe Turner, when Ma Rainey's Black Bottom opens on Broadway, this is like 84. It is the second Broadway play to open on Broadway by a black writer. And we know what the first one was A Raisin in the Sun. Been 20 some years. Who directed A Raisin in the Sun? Lloyd Richards. The first name in here. Well, after Lonnie Elder, Lloyd Richards. But what has happened to Lloyd Richards? Because of the bombshell success of The Raisin in the Sun, which put Woody King and all the people he interviewed, these greats of black theater, of a mind to say they want to go into theater. Hansberry kicks that door open. Of course, Imani wrote a whole book on, uh, on Lorraine Hansberry, looking for Lorraine. So, this radical, I mean, and, and you know, of course, Lorraine Hansberry in the mix with Paul Ropes and all the rest of them, just a you know, brilliant thinker and mover. Of course, our uncle, we tried to talk about him a whole nother time, William Leo Hansberry, who uh, was at, at Howard dealing with ancient Africa, puts on conferences on Nubia and stuff in the 1920s. That's his niece, Lorraine Hansberry. His brother, they from Mississippi, his brother helped sue to break down housing segregation in Chicago. That's where the idea for the Raising the Sun comes from, in part. So at any rate, Lloyd Richards, after directing that, he's huge, he's black dude. He ends up at Yale Rep. And he directing the O'Neill Playwright competition. So what happens? The year after Woody King's book comes out, 
August Wilson tries again. This time, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Jitney was the first one that he sent. Ma Rainey's was the first one he thought about because he had drafted something around Ma Rainey's even before Jitney. Then after Jitney got rejected twice, he sends Ma Rainey. They accept Ma Rainey. So let me just wind this up right quick on Wilson. There's a whole lot more. We should just spend another time on Wilson. We should just do a whole another time on Wilson. August Wilson said, I'm going to write a play for every decade of the 20th century and explain to myself and whoever else want to listen the journey of our people. And I ain't writing it with any ear in mind except the ear of what I heard, what I hear from my people. And I'm going to set this whole conversation up in Pittsburgh. Sure am. But the first one that he writes that gets picked up at the O'Neill workshop through the regional theaters and ends up on Broadway is the one that's not in Pittsburgh. The one we're going to watch, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, the film version of. But here go the 10 plays. He did it! Jim of the Ocean, 1904. Joe Turner's Come and Gone. Oh, that's my... I love... Mm -mm, let me not even do it. There we go. Ma Rainey's Black Bottom is the third in line because it deals with the 1920s, as you can see, but it's the first one he wrote. The Piano Lesson, they made a... You remember, they made a movie out of that. Charles Dutton was in that one as well. Alfred Woodard. Tony Morrison wrote, by the way, this is the collection, the 10-volume collection that was done by the Theater Communication Group. It's called August Wilson Century Cycle. I just like this edition. I mean, I got, you know, off volumes. But it's crazy because it's the same Theater Communications Group that when August Wilson in 19, 1996 gave a talk, this is when he gave his famous the ground on which my, I stand thing where he's like, I'm an African. I ain't never been to the continent of Africa. Never had any particular interest to go because I never stopped being African. And I'm going to fight y'all. Black people need their own theaters. Oh my goodness. Sound familiar? White people need to support independent black theater. What? <laughs> Sound familiar? Yeah. I mean, you know, so when we see August Wilson, it's like, oh, August Wilson. Yeah, but he came out of a whole context. A great, to use my man, um, Jeremiah Wright, the way he talks about it out of the biblical tradition, but he, he narrates as the African thing, a great cloud of witnesses. He said, look who's in the stands cheering you on. So when you see August Wilson, he said, I'm going to bring all these ancestors into this conversation. And sometimes they're going to fight with each other, like the piano lesson. Seven guitars. Fences, of course. Fences is baseball. We just saw him. I'm going to drop this in as a footnote because I know we're going on close on an hour now. Um, we saw last week that white Major League Baseball decided they were going to... Um, they were going to recognize the Negro Leagues. Let me tell you something. And I'm like, and we're talking, and I know you like see, you know Howard Bryant is your colleague, fellow journalist. I like Howard Bryant. Howard Bryant was on Roy Martin show the other night when I was on there on Thursdays, and he was talking about how, nah, see, I understand y'all gonna do this, but let's, you know, what is the detriment to this? You you gonna try to Lysol and cover up the stench of your racism by you're gonna recognize the Negro Leagues? First of all, you can't do it. Why? Because they're incomplete records and we're going to use the Negro League records. We're going to integrate them now. So maybe we'll have, you know, you can't do it. Why? There's no complete thing. And don't try to, y'all ain't slick. You're not honoring the Negro Leagues. You're honoring yourself in the narrative. This is part of that ongoing Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, Big George Floyd windfall of people saying, let's do this stuff to make y'all. Uh -uh. Y'all ain't slick. You're not slick. The Negro Leagues is bigger than you and they're incomplete records, and you cut it off a little after Jack Roosevelt Robinson comes in to white Major League Baseball, meaning now you're going to be the arbiter of when we should stop talking? Don't even do it. But those of you, let me get a couple of the children books that y'all can deal with. Young people who are watching, who always tune in, thinking about our young our young couple and, and the young brother and sister who were with us a couple of weeks ago. This I love this piece. Kadir Nelson's uh, we are the ship, the story of Negro League Baseball. It's by children. It's it's like a children's thing, but children's books are sometimes the best ones. It tells the story of the Negro League. And this brother is a, oh my God, he is a master illustrator and writer. This is together. There's the founder of the Negro Leagues, Andrew Rube Foster, 1920, Kansas City. Come on now. The Negro Leagues was the biggest business in Black America. This is what they did. So you recognizing those statistics, you're really just trying to, you know, I don't trust Negro League. Plus, y'all always talking about what are we going to do with uh, black people? Uh, there, there's a dearth 
of black people in uh, Major League Baseball now. We've got a real problem. We've got to get more black people in. You mean black people who speak English, don't you? Oh, I'm sorry. We don't use your narrative. I don't use your narrative of deciding who black and who's not black. Because when you read Kadir Nelson's book, he's going to tell you about all those black people who played in Latin America and how they stormed, barnstormed throughout Latin America. In fact, I'm going to see, can I find a good picture? Yeah. Baseball in Latin, baseball in paradise, Latin America. Is that guy black? I, I'm confused. Playing, but yeah, yeah, yeah. He black. Oh, so don't don't you dare try to exclude the Afro Latinos from the conversation when you say there's not a lot of black people. In the, it's hella black people in baseball, but most of them speak Spanish. But guess what? We have to think beyond your little narrow ass categories because the demographics. And finally, uh, this is a good photograph book that the Negro League Museum did in, in, in combination with uh, some other folks, Ernest Withers. And I'll tell you Ernest Withers story another day. Willie Mays did the, did the, interest, uh, did the int introduction, Negro League Baseball. There are a number of books on the Negro Leagues. The first one I read years ago was called Only the Ball Was White, which talks about that. But by integrating these people in, you can't integrate. Like, what you gonna do with this dude right here? Ar Oscar Charleston. Ar Oscar Charleston could have been the greatest baseball player to ever play. You know who said he was the greatest player he ever saw in all his life? The brother whose name we do know, Buck O'Neill. It's Buck O'Neill's autobiography. Buck O'Neill. But how, why do we know Buck O'Neill? Because the social structure said they're going to narrate their own history of where black people fit in, in, in American history. And Ken Burns, the godfather of telling the story of integration through the eyes of a white social structure. And here are the noble Negroes. Every time a Negro show up on a Ken Burns documentary, you start hearing that piano. Steal away. Steal away. Damn them. Pressed every time I see or some jazz me baseball jazz you know all the stories you got the negro civil war dropped in his footnotes and so buck o'neill brilliant storyteller he brings in the negro league energy when they're talking with a few other people ted double duty ratcliffe some of the other players but oscar charleston my guy you you know what people said you should call him the black tie cob and black people in the negro leagues was like nah charleston maybe you call cob the the white oscar charleston he was better than y'all. But what does Charleston do? By the time Robinson gets ready, playing for the Kansas City Monarchs, by the way, Jack Robinson started with the Negro Leagues. Charleston makes a deal with Branch Rickey, who ain't no hero. It's Chad Bozeman playing 42. They don't tell this story in the movie. Gus Greenlee, the former numbers runner who owned the Pittsburgh Crawfords, August Wilson, Fences, I ain't forgot. We got the line coming. All this, that's a Hill District story. The Homestead Grays, the Pittsburgh Crawfords. These are some of the great Negro League teams. There are five white Major League Baseball Hall of Famers on the Pittsburgh Crawfords. After the, after the Depression in the 1930s, when the Negro Leagues looked like it might fold, Rube Foster is dead. They done drove him crazy, stealing his players, this kind of thing. Then uh, another wave of Negro League owners comes in, led by guys like Gus Greenlee, who was a numbers man in Pittsburgh, because during the Depression, numbers people got some money. Again, Wilson has all this in his in his place. And you see, Greenlee buys all these players. At one time, you had Oscar Charleston, Josh Gibson, Cool Papa Bell, Satchel Paige. All them cats is on the Pittsburgh Crawfords. They are a behemoth. And when they barnstorm and play the white Major League Baseball teams in the offseason, they beat the tar out these white. Dizzy Dean is like, man, can't beat them Negro League teams. Damn right, we beat your ass. You got an all-star team. Casey Stingle, who was with the Mets and I mean, you know, and the Yankees and Mickey Mantle and all them. Yeah, put your all-star team together. We're gonna put our team together and they beat their asses. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, Major League Baseball, you ain't doing us no favors. We're gonna recognize, recognize this. I don't care. So, at any rate, I should mention one other sister because the Negro Leagues are fascinating. The the uh uh Jack Robinson. They're looking for talent. Branch Ricky said, I got to make me some money. Now, Ken Burns then write about the fact, you know, yeah, when he was young, he played with black people and he cried a little bit and he didn't want no discrimination. That's all cute for the narrative you weaving. But Branch Ricky ain't missed no money. So guess what? They have a secret meeting. And it's written about in the Oscar Charleston. It's written about all through the Negro Leagues, but this is a good one. Uh, Jeremy Beer's book, Oscar, Oscar Charleston. It's written about in this book. Gus Greenlee comes to New York to meet with Branch Rickey and them. Look, we're going to start a new Negro League because we think there's money to be made 
and the money to be made can be made and maybe things work out this can be a minor league to white major league baseball because black people been saying you should integrate major league baseball white major league baseball i don't never call it major league baseball because the negro leagues were major league in the governance structure white major league baseball we could integrate that yeah in fact one of the sisters who was pushing for it and i call her a sister you know coming this is the woman she and her husband owned the newark eagles i know you know her effa manley there's effa manley she is the woman co-owner of the Newark Eagles, and she made all kind of money. Effa Manley was born in Philly to a rich white dude, according to her own testimony later in life, and a white woman whose first husband had been black, who worked in the house of the rich white dude, and she was raised with the black half brothers and sisters. Her whole life, she passed as black. <laughs> there were people ever man i'm talking about people who worked with her because she kind of had an olive complexion what? I don't, this is a woman who made a choice to pass as black do you understand <laughs> who wow. was a negro league owner bigger than i mean everything and she goes to dc to propose the same thing gus greenlee proposing to branch ricky look we could if we made the negro leagues like a minor league we could make all make money go for it but see ricky richie ain't thinking like that so what happens People know about Jackie Robinson and the Brooklyn Dodgers. How many people have heard of the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers? The Brooklyn Brown Dodgers was the shadow team that uh, Branch Rickey went into business with Gus Greenlee and them in to create because he said, I can't go to Negro League games and scout. I can't send Negro League. I can't, you know, I can't send my scouts to the Negro League games. So everybody watching 42 in the movies. Oh, yeah, there's Harrison Ford sitting in the stands. Nah, hell no. Black people are like, what the hell? White people are like, oh, you can't. And so what does he do? Sets up the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers. And that's the conduit. Oh, I'm sorry. Oscar Charleston is recruited to manage the Brooklyn Brown Dodgers. And most sports and sports historians would argue that Oscar Charleston is probably the first black scout, open, open scout in white major league baseball. He's the one who tells him to sign Roy Campanella. He's the one who tells him to see Don Newcomb and all them, them cats who end up on the Brooklyn Dodgers. It's him. He doesn't know Robinson, but he knows those other cats. So I'm saying, you know, Branch Ricky was trying to make money. Like everything Woody King and told you about these people. If you see Robinson getting the claim, believe me, uh, Branch Ricky going to the bank. And when you don't give him the stadium he wants, him and Walter Austin, man, they're going to go to LA. So, I mean, let's, let's just be clear. So anyway, I still have to say this. In fences... What you see is August Wilson, by the time you get to Fences, what date? What is Fences? Fences is 1957. Robinson has been in Major League Baseball. The second person to come into white Major League Baseball comes off the Newark Eagles. Effa Manley's Newark Eagles, Monty Irwin. So now the Negro Leagues implode. It takes them a while to implode. That's why white Major League Baseball now, I'm sorry, Major League Baseball now is saying we're going to recognize the Negro Leagues, but we're going to cut it off uh, after 1950, 51, 52, because after that, you know, the quality diminishes. Go to hell. After that, you done raided the Negro Leagues. This was the biggest business we had. You collapsed it. Then you wait 70 years and say, we're going to recognize you. After people done died, after they ain't had no pension, after you think a plaque in Cooperstown is somehow payment for all the damn Jim Crow. No, I'm with Howard Bryan. I'm mad as hell. Y'all ain't going to wash y'all sins. And now, 50 years from now or next year for people who don't study nothing they're going to think it was always the numbers were always in there and the numbers you're using is BS we don't know how many home runs Josh Gibson hit we don't know how many home runs that Oscar Charleston hit we don't know how many bases that cool Papa Bill so Ty Cobb and them still going to be the top you think two Negroes just jumped up the stat line is going and Willie Mays average going to go down a little bit because he was playing for the Birmingham Black Bears don't get cute and you're not going to use Henry Aaron why because you think his time with the Indianapolis Clowns came after the quality of the Negro Leagues diminished so everybody go to hell you ain't fooling nobody Body. So at any rate, what you see August Wilson dealing with here, in addition to some people say working out issues between him and his father in fences by the 1950s, what you see, Troy Maxson is coming in. He's saying, hey, man, you know, you got a father who could have been a great baseball player, but racism. You got a son who wants to go to 
play football on scholarship. And the tension is there. The great James Earl Jones, of course, brought that to life on Broadway and beyond. James Earl Jones, no one them cats, of course, you know, uh, his father, of course, coming out of the black theater. So the last four plays, Two Trains Running, Jitney, King Henley II, and Radio Golf are tracing how these forces continue to, 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 to these social structure forces continue to beat up the black community. And in beating up the black community, what they're doing as well is forcing these black people to rely on their inner reserves of strength to do two things. Number one, be human in the world because our stories are not stories of woe is me and I'm just dead and yeah, I don't know pathology and all that stuff. Because Wilson always put the beauty of humor, the beauty of irony, the beauty of life at the center. He says, I'm not going to be a figment of your imagination. The ground on which I stand, the ground on which I stand is the ground of black beauty and black life. And yes, we struggle. And yes, we have the blues. He, fact, he said, my influences were the four B's, Victor Borges, but the other three black, Ramari Bearden, the blues and Amiri Baraka. Baraka, again, another one of those playwrights who comes up in that wave of women and men who are writing plays through that period when August Wilson emerges. So, He's saying, I'm going to ground it in black humanity. So when you watch my Rainey's Black Bottom, finally, you're watching a convergence. You're watching a woman who was born in Georgia into black institutions that to the social structure look one way, minstrelsy, burlesque, but in the governance structure of Africana, the ways of knowing, the science and technology, the movement and memory, the, uh, the cultural meaning making are ours. So she's negotiating that terrain. The opening scene of the Netflix piece is not in the play because, you know, plays take place on stage, which means you may have two settings or three settings. M many of August Wilson's plays just one thing. Joe Turner's come and gone. You got the yard. You got the boarding house uh, uh, in, 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 in the piano lesson. You got the house in uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. You have the recording studio, you got the other room. So this is what's going on, right? But in the Netflix movie, of course, Wolf and them, and by the way, I couldn't find my copy of it, George C. Wolf, The Colored Museum. I was looking for the play. <laughs> George C. Wolf is a beast. I love that brother. But at any rate, his play, The Colored Museum, get a copy of it. Because the thing about plays, plays are about language. So don't think you have to just see a play. You should just read a play from time to time. One of the beautiful things I loved about Fences because I saw that on Broadway with, with Denzel and Viola. Uh, but the beautiful thing about the movie, you know, we've been told black people talk back to the screen, and they do. I see <laughs> Negroes was talking back to the damn stage during Fences. That's a story for another day, of course. But um, August Wilson plays, you got to listen to the language. And when you listen to the language, when those lights went down, and yeah, you got them on the garbage truck. That's not in there because that's not in the play. It's in the movie. You can be everywhere. Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. They in the woods, as you say, run into the tent with Ma Rainey, that fancy tent. Boy, it's been a long road. In fact, I pulled uh, in anticipation. And in fact, I'm going to come back to that. But when the lights went down in the movie, everybody got quiet. Why? In a minute, you realize you got to listen to the language. Oh, this is a play. They basically filmed a play. And look at these black people here. Laughing in the right places, listening to the words, language, baby, language. That's August Wilson, language. And in fact, when you watch the Netflix, I pulled this. This is a brother. They've done a new edition of this. Like This is the old edition, the Collected Poems of Sterling Brown. Uh, Michael Harper did it. This brother right here is the giant, one of the giants. He did one of his most famous plays. I'm sorry. One of his most famous poems. He was a professor at Howard University for many years. His father was on the faculty. He was born on campus, in fact, August Wilson. One of August Wilson's most famous poems was published uh, in, a, in a collection called Southern Roads, called Ma Rainey. Many people have heard it. Give you a little taste of it. This is what August Wilson said. In his, in his, I'm sorry, this is what Sterling Brown said, Ma Rainey, because she is. Ma Rainey is the figure. Why? Because she's a representative of that culture, of that community. She's not trying to be white. She's not trying to bend the trends, as you see in August Wilson's play. This is what, August, this is what Sterling Brown said. When Ma Rainey comes to town, folks from any place, miles around, from Cape Girard and Poplar Bluff, folks flock in to hear Ma do her stuff comes flivering in or riding mules or packed in trains, picnicking fools. That's what it's like for miles on down to New Orleans Delta and Mobile Town, 
when Ma hits anywhere is around. They comes to hear Ma Rainey from the Little River settlements, from Black Bottom Corn Rows and from the lumber camps. They stumble in the hall, just a laughing and a cackling, cheering like roaring water, like wind in river swamps. And some jokers keeps their laughs a-going in the crowded aisles. And some folks sit there waiting with their aches and miseries till Ma comes out before them, a smiling gold toothed smiles. And long boy ripples minors on the black and yellow keys. Oh, Ma Rainey, sing your song. Now you's back where you belong. Get way inside us. Keep us strong. Oh, Ma Rainey, little and low. Sing us about the hard luck round our door. Sing us about the lonesome road we must go. I talk to a fella and the fella say, she just catch hold of us some kind of way. She sang backwater blues one day. It rained four days and the skies was dark as night. Trouble taking place in the lowlands at night. Thundered and lightened and the storm began to roll. Thousands of people ain't got no place to go. Then I went and stood upon some high old lonesome hill and looked down on the place where I used to live. And then the folks, they naturally bowed their heads and cried, bowed their heavy heads, shut their mouths up tight and cried. And Ma left the stage and followed some of the folks outside. There wasn't much more, the fellow say. She just gets hold of us that way. Before August Wilson's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, when you say Ma Rainey and you weren't talking about her direct song, you thought about Sterling Brown's poem, Ma Rainey. So in that opening scene in Netflix, when you see that, it's one thing to see it. It's brilliantly shot. It's great. You see the tension with Levy trying to come out and steal the spotlight. You see the girls. Everything is there. You see the great Glenn Terman. Glenn Terman. Karen, yo, who played the little boy in the film rendering of A Raisin in the Sun? Glenn Terman. This thing, you can't make this up. So the cat that played the little boy in Lorraine Hansberry's piece comes back with Ma Rainey, which was the, the next play Black people got on Broadway. It's Glenn Terman in the, come on. You can't make this up. And I think he might be a vampire because uh, oh, he, he, he ain't heard age since uh, Cornbread. No, what was that? What was that uh, movie he was in? in the, oh, what the Cooley hell? High. Cooley High. He Pre looked the damn same. Don't he? <laughs> oh, Don't my he? goodness. And he was amazing. Let me just, the acting in this all the way through. No, that's they very were, important, Karen, because this is the thing. The first generation of film actors Black film actors we know, like the so-called black organization, most of those cats were theater people. See, James Earl Jones comes out of the theater. You understand? When you see uh, Calvin Lockhart, when you see Cicely Tyson, when you see, when you see those first generation, so we think about Sidney Poitier, but let's be very clear, even Poitier comes off the stage. These are stage actors. So in this rendering, remember, and we talked about this. Those of you who want to check, go back to the uh, in class when we talked, when we did the whole thing on Chadwick Bozeman after he made transition. Chad Bozeman has a long article in the LA Times around the time that Bozeman made transition, which reminded people of the fact that, you know, the first time Chadwick Bozeman said he met August Wilson, he was a student. He, he had been there. He's watching August Wilson, Wilson workshop something at, on, on the stage. And he comes outside the theater and Wilson's out there smoking a cigarette. So he's a young cat. Hey, man, that's one tell you how much you know, I'm, a, I'm an admirer. I'm a... Chad, Chad Bozeman came from South Carolina, as we talked about, to write plays. He's a playwright. And so he asked Wilson, you have any advice? August Wilson told him, keep writing, son. Keep writing. You just keep writing. You keep writing. And Chad Bozeman comes out of the theater. You understand? They're, they're on film. But in many ways, what you're seeing, what we are seeing in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, directed by one of the masters in the wake of a band like Lloyd Richards or Lonnie Elder III or Woody King, what we're seeing, or in Tazaki Shange, what we are seeing is in some ways a filmed play. These are, these are theater actors. And so, you know, Denzel Washington, 
comes out of the theater. Uh, Samuel L. Jackson, they're in these Negro ensemble companies and all this kind of thing. So the acting is acting that has been honed by folks who have learned to project their humanity off of a stage. And I can tell you right now, as a former theater actor, that is one of the most difficult thing in the arts. They say in athletics, one of the most hard thing to do is to hit a curveball. Oh, I'm telling you, in performing arts, one of the most difficult thing to do is act convincingly. And when Viola Davis in Fences on Broadway told Denzel Washington when he brought that baby home that this day this child has gained a mother, but you have lost a wife. You got the wrong actors on stage. You wouldn't have had what I saw with my own eyes sitting in Broadway, which was all the Negroes in the audience. You tell me, but it wasn't Tyler Perry. All due respect. <laughs> all due respect we felt that here <laughs> go ahead i'm sorry no 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 no, no. Uh, uh there's a documentary on netflix that came on after i've i watched uh ma rainey on ma rainey which you know george wolf denzel who produced it all of the viola and uh marsalis uh winton yes. marsalis uh yes is the music director. And he talks about Chadwick Boseman asking for the horn keys because he didn't just want to pretend to play the, the, he wanted to learn. He said, who learns how to play the trumpet for a role? I mean, that's how powerful Chadwick Boseman is. He learned how to play the trumpet to yeah. play this role. I heard, I heard George Wolf tell you about how he kicked that damn door so hard. He kicked the door off the hinges. They had yeah. to put <laughs> And this, this is a man who is sick. And nobody know. Yeah. So no, that Ken, I think you really put your finger on something else as well. Correction, Branford Marsalis. Yes, thank oh, Bran you. Branford, Branford, okay. Branford, not Winton. Thank I not apologize. Winton. Well, no, 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 that, that's important because even between Bransford and Winton, there is very interesting. Uh, think about Ken Burns again, because both both those two those two of the Marsalis brothers are in Ken Burns' jazz documentary. And you know, went Marcellus, so you know, and I like them both for different reasons, probably. Because the, the, the memory keeper in me is partial to Winton in the sense that you know, there's some things that you people say we don't want to talk about how art and low art and you know, all the art is culture we produce. I don't believe that. Some stuff's better than other stuff, and you know how we know a hundred years from now. I think we'll probably still be listening to Billy Holiday and Marvin Gaye. Not so sure about these people who are winning awards now, but anyway, that hasn't been said. So I, 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 I sympathize with Winton, although I think sometimes Winton is more of a Europhile. That's why you, my, my dear friend and brother, Nick Payton, and some of them cats out of New Orleans, Terry Lynn Carrington, who's very good friends with Angela Davis, who she consulted in writing this book. They got a little different. I, I'm with them. But Bransford, I remember one time when Ken Burns asked Bransford Marcella something about the blues. And, and, he, and, and I guess, you know, all these interviews are hours and hours, and they just put a little clip in. But the clip they selected from, they had an informant before him. It might have been Winton. You know, the blues speaks to the agony, the pain, or maybe it was Margot Jefferson. I forget which one, because, you know, Burns has his favorites that he puts in. Gerald Early, you know, these black folks that kind of talk through the documentaries. But then Brands from Marcellus comes on and says, I mean, I hear the blues. I'm just saying, blues made me happy. That's the governance structure. This is what August Wilson was talking about. The blues is not just a purge. The blues is a connection. That's what Sterling Brown is saying. Sterling Brown is like, listen, you got to be on your own terms. Because if you're not on your own terms, you're somebody else's leftovers. Remember that scene? In fact, it's one of my favorite scenes in all of August Wilson's plays. And by the way, he, uh, let me see. Oh my goodness. What did I do with... Uh, I don't know if I, I thought I had it over here. Oh, yeah, here we go. My Rainey. August Wilson, by the way, he finished his 10 plays. He lived to see them all workshopped. The last one he made transition before it came back to Broadway in full, but he, he got it started. He was able to participate in the rehearsals, this kind of thing. So all 10. Eugene O'Neill said he was going to write nine plays to deal with American life. He only ended up doing two of them. And August Wilson got a theater name for him on Broadway. That's great. But August Wilson was like, we need to support black theater. We need to support regional theater because that's where the thing comes in. The house I live in is a local house like Penumbra, which is still operating in St. Paul, by the way, Minnesota. Uh, but remember that scene when uh, Levy and Toledo are talking about history. And by the way, well, anyway, here's the thing. Toledo. I love this. He said, uh, 
because this is August Wilson. This is really August Wilson's philosophy of history. Toledo says, uh, now I'm going to show you how this goes. Where you just a leftover from history. Everybody come from different places in Africa, right? Come from different tribes and things. Sooner while, they began to make one big stew. You had carrots, the peas, potatoes, and whatnot over here. And then over there, you had the meat, the nuts, the okra, corn. Then you mix it all up and let it cook right through to get the flavors flowing together. Then you got one thing. You got a stew. Now, you take and eat the stew. You take and make your history and with that stew. All right. Now it's over. Your history's over and you didn't eat the stew. But you look around and you see some carrots over here, some potatoes over there. That stew is still there. You done made your history and it's still there. You can't eat it all. So what you got? You got some leftovers. That's what it is. You got leftovers and you can't do nothing with it. You're already making you another history, cooking you another meal, and you don't need them leftovers no more. What to do? See, here's the line. We's the leftovers. The colored man is the leftovers. Now, what's the colored man going to do with himself? There's the question. That's what we waiting to find out. But first, we got to know we the left. First, we got to know we the leftovers. Now, who knows that? You find me a nigga that knows that and I'll turn any which way you want me to. I'll bend over for you. You ain't going to find that. And that's what the problem is. The problem ain't with the white man. The white man knows you just a leftover because he the one who done the eating and he know what he done ate. But we don't know that we've been took and made history out of. Don went and filled the white man's belly and now he's full and tired and wants you to get out of the way and let him be by himself. Now I know what I'm talking about. And if you want to find out, you just ask Mr. Irvin what he had for supper yesterday. And if he's an honest white man, which is asking a whole heap of a lot, he'll tell you he didn't eat your black ass. And if you please, I'm full up with you. So go on and get off the plate and let me eat something else. Y'all stop fighting to get in these footnotes in these people history. Unless you are leftover. If you're not going to be a leftover, you need to ask yourself what you are. This is what August Wilson is communicating in every line of every play that he's created. And he set them all to watch us walk through the 20th century, still asking this fundamental question. Who are we? How are we going to recover our ancestral memory? Ask that in Gem of the Ocean. How are we going to deal with this question of the forces that surround us that are African and our struggle to escape them and break the back of what happened during enslavement. Joe Turner's come and gone. How are we going to deal with each subsequent generation that's going to try to find its way into this field of violence and doesn't want to dig us, but it's going to bump up against us because everybody competing for the same dollar. Ma Rainey's black bottom. How are we going to confront the fact that we don't want to think about slavery, but those ancestors sacrificed for us? And if we turn our back on them, they'll turn our, their back on us. The piano lesson. What happens when the generation now has to face integration? That's from piano. I'm sorry. That's from Fences on Forward to Radio Golf. Wilson is grappling with this and he did it all. He asked the men in there, man, how you get to live to be 70 years old in America? Hugs Wilson died at 60. He didn't make 70. 60 years old. <laughs> I, I, I know we're going to question and answer in a conversation, but I do want to mention a couple other things just while I was on, because we we won't talk about it today, but we should at least mention it. Okay. Steve Biko would have been 74 uh, the other day, yesterday. I mentioned it because Biko, out of South Africa, he was only 30 years old when the police uh, killed him, South African Defense Forces. Uh, this His collection of essays that he wrote in life, I Write What I Like. This actually, this might be a South Africa edition. Yeah, it was. This is one of the ones I picked up last time I was in South Africa. Um, check him out because Biko created, well, he was part of something called the Black Consciousness Movement. I uh, went to the Apartheid Movement uh, a Museum. We were there back in 2007 and they had a nice exhibition, Biko, The Quest for a True Humanity. This is the brother um, out of Eastern Cape, was in medical school, dropped out, well, kind of, you know, neglected his medical studies, but continued to work to progress first with uh, black and white students and Indian students, but really form helping formulate something called the black consciousness movement, which is really the intellectual kind of, is the intellectual genealogy in South Africa we'd have to spend another day on to talk about some of these early cats that helped. Um, people like um, Anton Lembetti and others, uh, Robert Sabukwe, uh, Charlotte Makeke and, and many others who did this work. But Biko's importance 
is that he represents that next generation that comes of age in the 1960s and 70s that is pushing to collapse apartheid. And it's very important that we, we kind of stop and think about him because he, in some ways, and the women and men around him are the progenitors of the current uh, push, not only in South Africa, but around the world dealing with black consciousness. This is a recent book that just came out called The Black Consciousness Reader, which kind of talks a lot about, about Biko and the progeny and the work that they've done. But some of the recent, more recent stuff, you know, we've all heard about um, fees must fall in South Africa. It started with uh, the statues had to fall. And I, every time that Dr. Dana Williams and I would take students to South Africa uh, with Howard, you know, we would stay on college campuses. We usually stay at the University of Cape Town in, in Cape Town. And there was I spit on that statue of Cecil Rose more time than I can count. I can't do it no more. Why? Them students said it's got to get off this campus. So once that fell, they said, and you ain't raising no damn school fees. Fees must fall. Before you knew it, they had, they had, there's a documentary. I love the name of it. Everything must fall. In other words, this society got to be re renegotiated from the bottom up. And that's what Biko and them were talking about. Uh, this is Adam Habibi, who uh, Habib rather. Uh, Habibi means uh, like baby or sweet in Arabic. But this is Adam Habib. He's the chancellor at the University of Viswasaran. This is a book that he just wrote called Rebels and Rage that talk about the fact that these universities now have to renegotiate the terms of learning. I like to look at I like to think about what we do on Saturdays as part of that work, because, uh, oh, by the way, all your colleagues in, in the Cooney system, uh, you know, say hello and shout your praise. They had a uh, they had a meeting yesterday and they had a little mini Kwanzaa celebration. I kind of zoomed in for a second. My man, Tony Brown, your colleague at Hunter. Yes. Uh, was like, yes, he said, you know, uh, we love the work that you're doing. I said, our colleague has figured out a way to uh, explode the idea of the university. That's what he said about you. So, <laughs> and bring, bring right. Tony said that yesterday. So, but the thing got back to England because the Cecil Rhodes came out of England. They got rid of the statue and they fighting in South Africa. The thing got to Oxford. Here's the book, Rhodes Must Fall. The struggle for to decolonize the racist heart of empire. It didn't start in Africa. But now you got to explode the thing in the heart of where it happened. Uh, my friend and colleague, Tracy uh, Wyatt, Dr. Wyatt, has just written a book on Steve Biko called The Radical Gospel of Black Consciousness. Y'all can get this. Uh, Sankofa has a lot of these. She um, is doing it from the perspective of the, the Christian faith. Um, and then there have been many other uh, examples. Uh, this is actually the first edition of Colela Manguku's book, Biko, a biography, which is very good. And then they have a Steve Biko Foundation in Johannesburg. In fact, I was very honored to give a talk on a panel with Jerry Rollins, Kenneth Kaunda, the late Jerry Rollins now, at the Biko, the 30th anniversary of the death of Steve Biko. It's run by his son uh, in Cosimanti. So uh, these are the Steve Biko lectures. Actually, when I was there the last time, I picked this up at the Biko Foundation. Uh, Thabo and Becky gave the lecture, the president of South Africa, the year I was there, but in Gugi Wafiango, Wale Shayenka, so many others, and there are other pieces. But th th this notion of black consciousness, this political cultural orientation is very important because we have to shift the way we think. And so in America, rather than trying to be leftovers in somebody else's stew, the idea is who are we to each other? And it doesn't undermine the idea of the project. In fact, it may be the only way to save a project. You saw I me, mean, we were talking about Deb Holland last week. She's going to be the secretary of the interior. Not all these white nationalists going to scream bloody murder in the white nationalist party, but guess what? Run over them. Healing? Dude, back up, Joe. You did the right thing because everybody know you wanted to put when your buddy Tom Udall in there, but people came together and it's like, nah, Deb Holland. Imagine this. Imagine this. A Pueblo, First Nations person, is going to be in charge of the land that y'all took from her ancestors. <laughs> so, I mean, the possibilities. Now, I ain't saying this is without problems because you got a bunch of people in Oklahoma, for example. If you read books like the, uh, the All Black Towns of Oklahoma and stuff like this, like Acres of Aspiration, All Black Towns, you got the five civilized tribes, particularly them Cherokee and some of the Seminoles, them who want to deprive the so called freedmen, the enslaved Africans who were with them. Uh, G, uh, uh, full rights. And Deb Holland, along with Gwen Moore and a few others, unfortunately, were on the wrong side of this legislation that was proposed in Congress this year. But I would rather have Deb Holland as a Deb Holland is the Secretary of the Interior, which includes the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And my God, it's a different world. I'll end with this. This book just came out completely unrelated to everything we're going to talk about going forward. But I want to mention it because I just picked it up at San Cope a couple of days ago. And I'm so grateful to get it. 
This book just came out. Kasahun Chikole, who owns another black owned press, Africa World Press, the three big black presses, Africa World Press out of Trenton, Paul Coates, Black Classic Press out of Baltimore, Haki My Booty, Third World Press. This is the memoir of Sarah Collins Rudolph, the fifth little girl. Her sister was Addie Mae Collins. She was there in the little lounge when the bomb went off in Birmingham, but she lived. It's her picture with the cotton balls on her eyes that we see. And, and uh, Lorraine Hansberry wrote the wrote the uh, the narrative in this book called, uh, oh, it'll come to me in a minute. But at any rate, because that's the book that uh, Dao Bay saw the great photographer when he put together something called the Birmingham project is in his book, two American projects. In fact, Imani wrote an essay that went in here. He paired children who were around the same age as the girls that got killed with adults who would be the age that they would have been had they lived. And he took these pictures in Birmingham churches, but I mention it because Sarah Collins dedicates this book and she co she wrote it with Tracy Snipe, who's a brother, black man on the faculty at Wayne state in Detroit. I'd like to talk to this brother. He dedic she dedicates the book, y'all see the dedication page, to the parents of the children that were lost, but you include in there Johnny Robinson Sr. and James Ware Sr. Why? Because two boys lost their lives that day as well. Coming out of the Klan rally, these white boys, these crackers who probably still walk the earth. In fact, if you want to be the Attorney General Doug Jones, go find these white boys, put them in jail. Because uh, uh, Virgil Ware and his brother were delivering the Sunday paper that morning. These white boys shot at them, shot Ware, and he died in his brother's arms on the street the day after the bombing. And Johnny Robinson, the police killed him in cold blood. So he said he was throwing rocks at one of the police cars. They out there with the Klan. And, and I promise you, oh, I love it because the table of contents, remember, uh, most of these chapters are named for move uh, songs by John Coltrane. Why? Mm. Because, of course, Coltrane wrote the song Alabama and you know, the lore is the ways of knowing the movement and memory is that he patterned the sound of his horn to the cadence and tone of the sermon of the eulogy that Martin King gave at 16th street Baptist church for the girls and, and pray. So what, so what, way, what, what, what snipe does with Collins Rudolph is matches John Coltrane songs to the chapters in this book the fifth little girl we should tell our own stories i agree with imani on that you gotta you gotta get your family history and your stories from your people so i'll stop with that powerful uh i, <laughs> I don't know about the rest of y'all but you leave me speechless uh oh. every damn saturday <laughs> oh. well, look, you know one thing one, one of the many things i love about you is i suspect sometime between now and whenever we're gonna hear you talking to Sarah Collins Rudolph and I can't wait for one. So anyway, I'm just going to start with that. All right. All right. We, we are doing Q&A and let me just thank you again uh, for the the direction that I never know where you're going to go till you get there and it's just <laughs> the destination that we needed. So let me thank you for uh, no, your thank mind, you. which I don't even know. I wish we could study it. No. How you can stay on to get us anyway. No. Uh, no. These are people. Yeah, let me welcome in uh, Mr. Glenn. Glenn is uh, let me let me just find Glenn is from Richmond, Virginia, and let Brother. me thank you for being here. All right, unmute. You ready? Okay, come on, Glenn, talk. All right, we cannot hear you. He's coming. All right. They may have a black woman governor, although my man's is running down there. How uh, you him? Justin, uh, Justin Fairfax running for governor, but he's running against uh, several other black people, including some sisters. And they already think they'd have picked Terry McAuliffe. No, 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 no. So y'all gonna y'all gonna learn one of these days. It's over for that little settler comment you talk. You on Glenn? You good? Glenn? That right. A looks like Auburn. Is that Auburn? I don't know. He's unmuted. Speak, speak, brother. Or for, or now, mute now. Mute. Unmute, Glenn. Let's and I'm like, let's be ready. You want me okay. to take you out and bring you back, bring you back and, and bring in the other? All right, we're going to do that. Uh, Glenn, get it together. We will. Oh, that's like Virginia you, and I'm going to bring in somebody else. Yep, we're going to get yeah, ready. Man, I want to talk to Glenn. Glenn from the Cradle of the Confederacy. <laughs> Rich right. Let me welcome in Mr. Ali. I don't that's know. my where big brother, Ali. <laughs> What's going on, Dr. Carr? How you feeling, man? 
Come on, man. You know it's Greg, man. Look, hey, y'all. Y'all gotta know, brother Ali. You gotta walk us through the whole history of the Northeast, particularly Newark, African Echoes. This is one of yes, our sir. front line warriors. How are you, Baba? I I'm good, man. I I'm trying to be. You know, I, I literally had to pull. Up. First, I want to say I'm a fan of Karen since she used to be on a show on Democracy Now. What Esther Armand? They used Whoa. to come on that Tuesday, and that's when I got introduced to Karen Hunter. So, Miss. <laughs> But um, I had to pull up. I'm, I'm actually off of my Avenue in Newark because really, I run around and this show really has to. I have to change how I do things. So I had to <laughs> in the heart of Newark. So I just had to kind of give give a shout out to that man. <laughs> you got hey, look, my man, my man uh, Jay Smith did this piece in uh, he's at University of Massachusetts. It's called Brick City Vanguard. Uh, wow. American Rocker, Latin wow. music, Latin music. It just came out a couple of months ago, but it ain't nothing in here you don't already know. I'm just telling you, man, because you, uh, you lived this. These cats write about it, but you lived it. What's going on, mama? Ain't nothing, man. I, I Actually, I had three questions. First of all, I want to say what you what y'all are doing is brilliant. And Miss Hunter was right when she said, did you want to literally wind up uh, being uh, mesmerized uh, at the end? Everything. I had to redo everything in order to uh it's a being able to see you every Saturday in your glory, man. And we, we gotta no. bring you back to New York, man. We got to. Yeah. We got to we gotta do that. We we gotta do that because for those of you who don't know, when you see me, you see uh brother Ali. You looking at cats that were formed out of community. So anything come out yes, of my sir. mouth, like anything come out of yours, brother, came out of the collective. So people looking I at me, don't look at me, look at who taught us. In fact, that Jack Carruthers used to always say that, man. He said, so all them cats, man. Absolutely. I'm gonna tell you that that's what my question is going. I got three questions, and I'm I'm, yes. I'm gonna give it to you as, as quick as I can. Okay. One, and you kind of touched on it in the beginning of today's lecture. That's the kind that of, you always say that's how the ancestors work. So no important is the lineage of these study groups you know i mean we have them and people don't realize it at one time that um they were all over and we were studying the same tech we were studying stolen legacy at least yeah. when i came into the fray you know what yeah. i mean we were studying stolen legacy and people were studying that all and i, and I didn't realize that until i came to an ascat conference and I, we were talking and I says, wow, you know, so that was going on every place at the same time. Yes. How important that was. The second question, and this is this has something to do with my addiction. And I'm, I'm coming to you as a counselor right now. <laughs> <laughs> How do we curb or control our our um, our bibliophilia, if that's oh. a word? How do we how do we control that that bit man listen I oh my God. dropping a hundred dollars on, on a couple of books matter of fact it was a book that you mentioned about two weeks ago um that I mean it's just it's overwhelming and I'm gonna tell you right now you and Kevin Hunter are creating a, a, a whole gang of people that are gonna be addicted now because of these books <laughs> man so <laughs> The third question, there's a book, and, I, and I'm hoping that maybe you can kind of uh, uh, lead me in the way. It was a book that I read on John Coltrane uh, years ago when I was an undergrad at Johnson C. Smith University. And yes, sir. The Bulls. Golden Bulls. Golden Bulls, right? <laughs> Golden Bulls. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. And it was a, a writer from Amsterdam News. They wrote a biography. Because, uh, you know, it's a, bunch of, it's a bunch of biographies. I got about three or four. But the yeah. one that's a, a writer. But the, the Amsterdam Who's wrote it was like the best one I had written. I mean, I had read it, uh, and I uh, lost. Uh, that book. Was it J. O. Simpkins? Maybe. Simpkins did one, and there was a doc. Yeah, there are a couple that were done. In fact, man, if I could, I'd never be able to find it in five minutes. But yeah, I know we talking about. Uh, can you describe the book? It's, it was it was a beige cover. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's the one. It was a that's the one. So what's what's the name again? I think Jay. it's called Cold Train. Hold on. We had to look it up. Look up S I M P K I N S. I'm taking notes. I'm, no, I'm not. But I, I, I really I 
Because I want to say the brother was a medical doctor too. But he, yes. But he interviewed like family friend. Yeah, and that's one because it's one called Spirit Catcher. I mean, there, there are no. And of course, there's a new children's book that came out around the same time as the documentary that just came out. Actually, the, the children's book is, is fire. But I think you know, it was. Yeah. New Jersey, uh, A67 Broad Street, literally has the largest uh, in the, in the Northeast, the largest selection. Of, of children's books, black children's books, Nina, Nina Simone, Muhammad wait, wait, Ali. Really? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Source of knowledge on at 867 Broad Street, my man Dexter. I knew him since I was a teenager. Yeah, no, I remember it's, when we were there for ASCAC before we went through there, man. You know, we can't come to Source over there on the main strip, the, the store. Yes, right there. Yes, you know who's telling me you need to drop the, uh, money in there a lot, man? Is your man's uh, David West? Because I know David yeah. West came up in, 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 in yeah. Got you, got you. Yeah. 67 Broad Street. So when you mentioned that about the children's books, let me tell you something. And you met my daughter when she was first born. She's six years old no. now, right? <laughs> let me tell you, every Saturday we make our, our hajj to the source of knowledge to actually uh, 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 buy books for her and my son. It's so not an addiction. Right. It's a form of prayer. <laughs> Absolutely. You just answered the second question, brother. You, we got to pray without ceasing. I think that may be in the Bible and the Quran. So I don't know about the Odu'i 5, but... Uh... Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, this, I just wanted you to kind of, like, touch on that because we still do our, our study group after um, almost 40 years. My We're going God. virtual now. Because we, we have could no you choice. Tell a little about that because the people might want to know about that. Please tell them a little bit about that, that particular study group, Bob. And Echoes is a grassroots organization that was developed probably in the early part of the 90s. It was developed by uh, Baba Inouye, Aaron Stedman, but Baba Inouye, uh, he used to travel over to First World in Harlem. Yes. And he used to, he did, well, that's what I'm on, on Sundays, because First World lecturers come and speak on Saturdays. Yes. So he came on to, he went to Bill Jones first, and Bill Jones kind of, you know, said, I get out of here. But his wife, you know, you know, she, 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 no she kept, pulled him to the side and said, I got you. So that's what African Echoes here, here in North, uh, what we used to do, we would have on Sundays, we would have a study group with Sim, Professor Simmons, would, would lead our study groups. Professor Simmons, Brother Trust, you know, Brother Trust going to do his thing too. Come so and I got that as a kid, man. Yes, when sir. I was eight, years old, I'm sitting there and, and Simmons asking me questions, you know, is God the devil or a devil? And I'm looking at this guy like, what? You know? <laughs> hey, man. Hey, 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 hey. Ali, there's a brother, uh, there, there's a dude named Garrett Felber who's at the University of Mississippi. They telling him they're not going to renew his contract because he's got the nerve to challenge these racists down in Mississippi who are trying to give money to the University of Old Miss and this kind of thing. He's a white dude. But he, he just wrote a book and the reason I mentioned him, in addition to the fact that y'all need to back up off of anybody who is criticizing these universities for these white donors doing this kind of thing. But That's right. So That's people right. are saying they're not going to speak that in this kind of thing. But the book he just published uh, 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 last year is called Those That Know Don't Say, Those That Say Don't Know. It's about, mm. of course, that's the phrase from the nation. So when you start talking about Professor Simmons and them cats, man, those that know don't say, those that say don't know, what y'all are saying is there are people who are making careers off of trying to write books about these organic institutions, and then there are the people who are right. part of them. Those are That's two right. different categories. And so I'm saying right. a couple of things, Baba. One is uh, you got to write the history of African Echoes. And this goes for everybody who's in this conversation. If you go back and, and look, as I said, my friend Imani Perry was talking in conversation with Karen. Uh, you look on YouTube, you see the clips. Start with the family histories. Jacob Carruthers, who trained, who helped train both Brother Ali and myself. And when I say train, I mean, we are we are apprentices in an organic tradition. This is work that we learn. Study groups, study work. And I'll say more about the study groups in a second, but Ali asked about that. Um, and of course, he's asking about it because he knows he's asking about it more or less for us to have that conversation in this broader conversation. Um, we're brought into the these groups of just folks, folks who understand the importance of reading, of thinking. I mean, it would be great if you wanted, you know, after you watch my Rainey's Black Bottom, you know, watch it on Netflix, but get a copy of the play and assign different roles to children. And until we're out of this plague, maybe have a Zoom and have them do a staged reading of the play. 
So to get the words in their mouth, get the language, because Wilson's words come alive when human beings reproduce them. And there are words that he has heard. He's heard these conversations. So the study group tradition that you just heard Brother Ali talk about, uh, Ali, you're talking about African echoes, you know, that's part of a larger network of study groups that goes back, honestly, in many ways to even during enslavement, when we would fight our way out and have a little room to operate. You talk about Yonkers study group, John Edward Bruce and them in the early early 20th century, uh, Arturo Schomburg, the New York Society of Historical Research. Uh, you got the Bethel group down here in D.C. Y'all saw what these white boys try to rip down the signs in front of Emmanuel. I'm sorry, Emmanuel. I'm thinking about a mother Emmanuel in South Carolina because it is the sister church to Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal, which is in many ways the national cathedral of African Methodism here in D.C. And of course, the parent church is in Philly. South Philly, Mother Bethel. But um, white boys trying to trip, rip signs down out in front of Metropolitan. And if you all haven't checked out uh, my friend and brother, very good brother, William Lamar, Reverend Lamar, who, who is the pastor of that church, uh, Metropolitan, he's been talking about the fact that they will not be deterred. They had a study group. They have a study group continuing their work. Dana Williams, again, there, his partner is doing this work as well. And a lot of other people, Elsie Scott and others, many people coming through Metropolitan. They have a study group that goes back to Fred Douglas and them. it goes back to the Bethel Literary Society. They're having debates in the 19th century about all these things. Du Bois comes and speaks. And but these study groups, uh, we see the American Negro Academy, 1896, uh, founded here in D.C. I mean, we could go on and on. But the point is that. Many of these study groups are not just the folks who are going to college who have fought their way out and have a little, you know, room to operate. You got places like the Harlem History Club, 1930s, the Edward Blyden Society, named for Edward Wilmot Blyden, who was a contemporary in many ways of a little younger, but around the same time as Alexander Crummel. Um, very important. Who Crummel founds the American Negro uh, Academy. But I'm saying I have to say this. When you look at those study groups in the YMCA's, the YWCA's, these, these are the networks that Carter Woodson is feeding and tapping into when he start the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. You see them carry us through the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. By the time you get to the 60s, there is an explosion again of these, these beyond university study formations. And then during the 1970s and 80s, there's a continuation and a tapping into this kind of black power, black nationalism, pan-Africanism. And so by the time Brother Ali and I come on the scene, we're brought into these study formations that are now deeply rooted in places like Dallas, the Third Eye, uh, Columbus, Ohio, the African Center for Study and Worship. Uh, New York City, the crown jewel was, as he mentioned, the great uh, first world, the first world, the great Bill Jones, uh, who former labor organizer, brother, was, and his wife, Sister Kefa, Kefa Neptis uh, is her African name. In praise of African life, they would start that ritual. Uh, and, you know, I know there's a lot of people who are in this audience right now, in this conversation right now, uh, who I met the first time, 1989, when Tony Brown, Karen, your colleague at Hunter, took me to First World because I was saying, these are my heroes. I want to see them in person. John Henry Clark and Joseph Benyakin and Edward Scobie and all these cats, Charcy McIntyre, Marimba Ani, Asa Hilliard, Charles Finch, all these people, I mean, who are walking, uh, Ivan Van Sertema, all these people. And so this was the study group. The African Echoes Formation in Newark, where Brother Ali, where you at, that formation is it, it comes out kind of parallel with uh, First World, comes across the Hudson, and now they're in Newark. And I'm saying I have to say this. In the, in the early 1980s, they started talking about putting together a, a formation. Let's form all these groups that have been doing all this work in a kind of a federation. And that's the first meeting of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations, ASCAC. You heard Brother Ali say that. I'm the first vice president of ASCAC. We're led by uh, Brother Mario Beatty, the brother I was talking about earlier, who teaches Egyptian hieroglyphs at Howard now. Uh, my dear friend, best friend. What we see is that that formation is people who are already doing that work. And then they begin to bring in new people who want to learn in that tradition. And so the tradition continues. It's not the university based tradition. It's valuable university based tradition. But we ain't never going to get out of this through the universities. And by this, I mean this deep conversation with our culture. You saw August Wilson walked away from high school, got the rest of his education at the library. That's what John Clark did. You understand when he goes looking for more Arthur Schomburg in 1933. So. I guess what I'm saying finally is that uh, Ali, I, I love this format, Karen, because he's not so much asking the question as making an observation. The lineage of study groups put the floor under everything that's going on now. And as with everything else African people produce, 
at some point it looks like it's potentially profitable in the case of the academy it becomes something people think they can convert into something they can use for career advancement nah as rakim said you couldn't pick it up it was too heavy to hold you couldn't pick it up <laughs> drop the mic you shouldn't be holding it this is how it should be done in other words you know but you know that of course is from eric b and rakim i know you got soul that's what gets you into the study group your intent your spirit once you in the rest of it we add those are just those are just that's just about reading and sitting around a conversation and then building based on that information and when we use it correctly you can do anything you build your institute which brings me finally to the second question because we talked about the we don't curb the bibliography what we need now is brick and mortar institutions people are building family libraries people have family libraries meaning libraries in your home in your apartment in your space um we need more independent institutions. I don't mean HBCUs. I do not mean public libraries. I don't mean special collections where folks come in with resources and absorb things that our people fought to preserve and keep independent. And then people wait two generations to people gonna throw stuff out, write a check and all the stuff is now in the Ivy League or something. No, hell no. I mean, if you've got physical space, a house you're not using or a rental property or better yet a building you've purchased or can collectively put your money together and purchase that's what mariba kelsey and them did with the african center in columbus ohio that's what you see uh the the folks at the comedic institute in chicago jim Crozen, oh my god you know we need to buy a property then we start creating physical spaces where we can house materials like this because we need to be in control of those spaces so um no i'm i'm never gonna be one to I don't know why he call it biblio. Well, that's the West call it bibliomaniacs. I worked for a bibliomaniac, Charles Bloxon. So, I mean, they, uh, Nicholas Basbane wrote a book called A Gentle Madness. That's what uh, some of the Europeans call book collecting. But as the people who invented reading and writing, nah, you just get a bigger space. That's all. <laughs> or a storage unit, as you have. Yeah. Uh, and then eventually a library, which was. Eventually. Like, yeah, we're going to. Uh, yeah. Our lips to God's ear. That's right. Yes, we're going to make that happen. Uh, let's see if if our brother is ready. Mr. Glenn, let's welcome him in. Hey, Glenn. Hey, Glenn What's from up? Virginia. How y'all doing? Yes. Good. Right. Right. yes. What, what, I'm, trying to get, I'm trying to get to orange and blue. I see Virginia State, but it could be Auburn. Who is that? Oh, no. Well, this is uh, Armstrong High School, but I'm a Virginia State grad, so it's all good either way. Oh, as in Samuel Chapman Armstrong? Yes, sir. That's what oh, I was talking yes. about. The, the, so the, the, you, the evil genius. Yes. <laughs> General Howard's friend. <laughs> right. How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm good, man. Nice to see y'all. I want to thank y'all for this um forum because this has been a blessing for me. Um, I'm an educator and I teach at um Armstrong High School here in Richmond. Yes. So what do you teach, brother? Well, I'm a um, active student activities director, so I'm in charge of all the athletics and then the um school organizations, and then also I teach a class called Teachers for Tomorrow, Ooh. which we try to prep students that are um interested in going to teaching you know so, so you the so, brother who when all else fails they come get mr glenn because they're gonna listen to you <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah and I, so i i can't i got two questions um a yes, couple of months maybe a month or so ago you were talking about samuel armstrong as it relates to booker t washington and creating the normal schools and so forth yeah and then you know it dawned to me i'm in the you know the first school for blacks here in Richmond, Virginia. And, um, you know, I'm thinking about all of these great people that came through just this school, like Doug Wilder, Maga L. Walker. I was going to ask, um, that's Magdalena Walker's yeah, alma mater. You know, yeah. e. Rob Max Robinson and Randall Robinson, Admiral Gravely, all of these people. And I'm trying to think of a program that I can kind of connect to my students. And, you know, you've been talking about your um, Philadelphia Freedom Schools movement. Yes. And I'm like, what can I do to try to create a club or organization to integrate, to integrate some, you know, some type of uh, class or a group, you know, in my school? So do you have any type of resources or, or, or references, you know, curriculum that I can integrate? Because I'm saying that because my school house students that come from five housing project, projects here in Richmond and we got we have some great students resource resourceful students but we have to do things to keep them involved so that we sure. can put them on the right path sure you know so 
you know, my 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 question would be your any references as far as what can I do to create a curriculum, whether it's because I know that your it was a summer program, but I, I, I think I need to do it throughout the year somehow. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, right. so we, that's we my meet, first question. We meet um we meet uh weekly. In fact, uh Ansheree Hines and um the Center for Black Educator Development, uh uh uh, who do a lot of work, uh, Sharif el Mackey, my brother, Sharif el Mackey, who runs that, uh, Shane Terrell and others in Philadelphia. We, 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 we meet. In fact, we just, uh, we're firming up selection for, uh, the summer program, but we've been reading this semester, the lost education of Horace Tate, Vanessa Silla Walker's book, but a couple of things very quickly. First and most importantly, every week, as more and more people are in this conversation, some of those resources, you know, we, you know, we work, we're looking toward 2021 to create maybe, among other things, an exchange where people can share information and network, because this is a lot of the work is really just becoming aware of what people are doing other places. That's number one. And, you know, you can email me offline and, and, I, and I'll share, you know, some of the things, including the curriculum we wrote in Philadelphia. We're very proud of that. And we, we, we continue to write, continue to work. But more specifically to Richmond and to Virginia in general, but particularly Richmond, in particular, Samuel Armstrong. You know, one of my former classmates uh, who sits on the Virginia Historical Commission, uh, Kalita Nichols Fairfax, uh, Dr. Fairfax. She's at Norfolk State. So don't, you know, behold the green and gold. I know she's not a Trojan, BSU, but uh, it's a very good sister. Brilliant sister has done a lot of work on African and African-American history and culture in the Commonwealth. Uh, she's someone who, uh, yeah, let's, let, let's get the two of you all linked because, uh, of course, the legendary Armstrong High School you know, those young people are heir, direct heir to the momentum of generations of black achievement. And so part of it is digging into that history. What we found in Philly, for example, is and this ties to Carter Woodson. When you look at the Negro History Bulletin, a lot of the work in the Negro History Bulletin in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s was particularly the period in the 1930s, 40s, 50s and 60s was school teachers, educators more broadly and and students writing histories of their schools, writing histories of local people and submitting them to what was the magazine for educators, black educators in the country, which was the Negro History Bulletin. Uh, it still publishes the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, now African-American Life and History. Uh, Sylvia Cyrus is the executive director here in DC, uh, she, headquarters here in DC. That might be something to get started again, Glenn, seriously. Um, but I'll put you in contact with uh with with Coco with Kalita because she does she does the work and she and she's aware of probably just about everybody else who has any kind of visibility in the state. And you should not only be a part of that network, your students, man, they got more work because that work needs to be done. You at Armstrong, y'all should be leading in that work. And I think that's gonna be good. The other thing is, I don't know if you know the brother who's the uh, the current president of Virginia State, Macola Abdullah. Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. Macola, man. Tell McCullough, Greg Carson, you got to put some work on it, man. That's my. Gotcha. <laughs> he, he came out, he got his PhD. Uh, it was at Northwestern, but he's a Howard undergrad. Good brother. It seems to me that what we have to do, especially with these HBCUs now, because a lot of HBCUs are talking about these educator programs. They want more teacher, right. teacher training. Mm -hmm. as, uh, as Samuel Armstrong's most prominent student once said in 1895 at the Atlanta Cotton Exposition, cast down your bucket where you are. So in other words, if you're HBCU and they're not linked to you at Virginia right. at Samuel Armstrong, the question mm -hmm. is, what the, what's wrong with you? Ain't Virginia wow. Union still in a <laughs> rich <Right>. mm -hmm. <laughs> In other words, but look, man, let's talk offline. And Karen, okay. to make sure you, you, you get my email and everything. Got I got and, one and, more question. We're going to connect, brother, because... Yeah, we we in fact, you you got some stuff to teach our students in Philly. We need to because you know the migration pattern. A lot of those kids, people came out of Richmond, right? So we need we need we need your students, you and your students, to connect with us, especially now, because we can do it with technology. Absolutely. Here's yes. one more. Here's one more question. And oh, yeah, it's actually it's actually for. As I, actually, for both of you all. Come on, Karen. Um, Where she go? There she go. <laughs> all right. So, currently, we're in this um, pandemic. What do you feel as far as the trajectory of education for K through twelve? You know, going forward, because the way I see it is, there might be a even when we go back into the building, there might be an opportunity to excel with partial virtual. I see it. 
around in the suburbs here, they already have virtual. They had that prior to the pandemic. You know, they had the tools, but now we were forced to give our kids laptops, give them hotspots. But there might be a um, population within our school that might be able to thrive in this um, virtual setting. Others might be great going back into school because, you know, so different types of learning. So now that we were forced into this technology, we might be able to, you know, help kids that are great at that to succeed as well. What do you think about how is it going to go back to just the regular, go back into the building? Or do you think we, we have an opportunity to um, advance? Our Oops, I'm sorry. Home. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, that's up to us, right? Uh, every district that we live in, there's a school board or city council. Uh, it's up to us. We, I think we abdicated that responsibility to the powers that be. And now we realize that, first of all, teachers are probably the most important uh, people. The most important people in our society are our teachers. I think a lot of parents now are really realizing that. But it's up to us to shape what that education looks like, what kind of books we're going to use. And as black people, I think it's important for us now that we know what we can do is to create these African centric spaces on the weekends after school. Where, where our kids can come together and learn about themselves and their position in society and history. Uh, because as we see with this president, this current president with this 1776 project, they are hell bent on making sure that we don't know. That's right. They're hell bent on making sure that their history, their made up fake history is going to be the, the due north for all of us. And so we have to fight that with every fiber of our being and that means we have to show up in our communities and make sure we demand of our schools what we should get. And teacher pay should be on the table and all of that. Right. So but that's up to us. So that's a us question. Everywhere we live, we have the power to make a difference in terms of what the schools should look like. And then we have to put the extra work in the way other communities do, because they don't just send their kids to school. They, they make them go through different, yeah, every community outside of ours, whether we're talking about our Asian brothers and sisters, Ooh. our Jewish brothers and sisters, they have extra schooling for their kids to make sure their kids know who they are. So why aren't we doing that? So that's my opinion on that, Dr. Can I just add one thing as you were talking, it made me think about this as well. You know what? When, we, when I was in the thing yesterday with the Cooney folks, one of the brothers, and it might have been Arthur Le Lewin, who is at um, Baruch, you know, Arthur Loon. I'm looking back because he did a book on black studies. I meant to mention uh, yesterday we were talking. He was talking about, and I know you, you, you know, you probably talked about this during the week. Uh, the New York City, I guess the Blasio administration is saying they're going to look at and refigure the special admit criteria for those crown jewel schools in the New York City public schools, high schools. And they were talking about yesterday the fight in the 1960s and 70s to get more black students into those special admit schools. Is it Stuyvesant, Bronx High School of Science? I mean, you know, list, you know, list better than I do in the city. And what he said is they found out during that fight that some of their colleagues who happened to be Jewish were using part of the Saturday schools, the Sabbath schools, yeshiva schools, however you want to call it, the, the, the supplemental education work they were doing to help teenagers study for the regents exam because that's how they were using it. So, so you're absolutely right. This is on us. This is what Wilson is saying in Joe Turner's Come and Gone when he puts, I'm sorry, when in, in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom when he puts that speech in Toledo's mouth. He said, don't look to them. You leftovers in their mind. The question is, who are you to yourself? And that's that governance question. Uh, so that, that other than that, you you laid it out, Karen. And one other thing I would add, uh, brother uh, uh, brother Glenn, before we move on, is I would be remiss if I didn't neglect uh, if I didn't uh, mention two other people that you know we'll be emailing and talking. Uh, two of the most brilliant people I know, most committed to our people, deeply committed, who also have students. Uh, one not a native of Virginia, other native of Virginia, one working in Virginia at in higher ed, the other one now not working in Virginia, higher ed, but a Virginian in his heart, graduate of Norfolk State. Uh, the brother is Corey D.B. Walker, Dr. Walker, my very good friend who's now at Wake Forest University. He's about founding and director of the African Studies program there, um, who came out of uh, Norfolk State, 
uh, who worked for years at Brown University, uh, who then left the Ivy League and went to Winston-Salem State. Shout out to Winston-Salem State. See, so y'all got some of that Mackenzie Scott money, along with uh, one of Corey's very good friends, uh, uh, who is now uh, Dr. Simmons, Ruth Simmons, who's the president at Prairie View, uh, got some of that money. And Corey was in at Virginia Union, and now he's at Wake Forest. But uh, we'll connect you to Corey because he is very deeply involved in a lot of Virginia history and culture work. And finally, uh, one of the most brilliant people I know in heart. I mean, this is a brilliant sister. She's the current chair of the history department at the University of Virginia. And that is the incomparable Claudrina Harrell. In fact, she, I was talking about her a couple of weeks ago. I'm just about done with her latest book, When Sunday Comes, Claudrina in Harold right there, Gospel Music and the Soul and Hip Hop Era. Brilliant sister, Claudrina. And she's a filmmaker. So while uh, she's there in Charlottesville, and while, uh, and I'm sure Adrena, wheels are probably spinning because the students love her you talk about somebody that puts people through their paces she does that and she's a filmmaker y'all might decide one of the things you might want to do glenn is get these young people and ask them y'all want to do a documentary on the history of armstrong high school i got some friends who you know got some students and we'll partner together and we'll learn how to work these cameras and y'all already know the rest of the technology we need a good armstrong high school documentary and of course people got to interview the armstrong graduates people got to go into archives let those students make an Armstrong uh, documentary. That would be brilliant. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, let me bring in the next person. This is Travis. Travis is from, hold on, hold on. Let me scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. Travis is from San Antonio, Texas. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, guys, oh. Remember the Alamo, bro. Oh, it's crazy <laughs> down here. <laughs> you know, remember, look, look, remember that Negro that Jim Bowie had enslaved in there, and that's how come he died because Bowie, the damn slave owner, had the Africans trapped in the Alamo. Santa Ana was on, on our side. But anyway, <laughs> how you doing, man? I'm doing great. They don't tell that story here. They Bruh, don't tell that story here. Hey, look, I know you. Look, man, I'm looking behind you. You got self taught. You got James Anderson. You got the Freedom Rider Joint. You got Fannie Lou Hammer. You got Lerone Bennett. Come on, man. Are, are you a native San Antonio? Mississippi. Mississippi. That's me. Oh, what part? From Monticello, actually, uh, Jefferson Davis County, uh, actually. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, so that you know area. exactly where Oxford is, Old Miss. Exactly. And matter <laughs> of fact, uh, I met Dr. Ferber uh, a couple of years ago at a mass incarceration uh, forum at Tougaloo College. Tougaloo, and, brother. Yes, sir. And then he was uh, actually talking about the book he was writing about uh, Malcolm X. So yeah. uh, we conversed well, a couple of times. Good piece, man. Yeah, yeah, he's a good guy. My man, oh yeah, he seemed like a good guy. Matter of fact, uh, 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 Nick Cannon and I read it together when it came out because Nick was doing some work thing about the nation. So we 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 ordered it, read it, chopped it up, and now they after the brother man. But you know that yeah. mass incarceration work. I'd like to hear more about that. I saw Tougaloo got some uh, money too. I'm gonna say maybe six million, five million, something like that. Uh, right. You a Tougaloo grad? Uh, no, sir. Uh, actually, uh, I retired from the military about six years ago, so that's what why I'm here in San Antonio. And so, uh, but I'm working uh, right Air now. Force? Yes, sir. Yeah, I figured and, uh, San Antonio, yeah, Air Force, baby. Yeah. Man, yeah. It's, man, it's good. It's good having to talk with you, brother. I, I, yeah. I, I love you guys, me and my wife. I mean, 2020 has been crazy, but uh, one uh, thing that kept us going was you guys, you and uh, Miss Hunter and the forum you guys have, and uh, we just really appreciate it. You know, we, we're together on this. I saw you reach back. You must have pulled one of them joints off the uh out the arsenal. <laughs> well, actually, uh, my cousin wrote this, Thomas Armstrong the third. Oh, that's your cousin. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, I have yes, that, sir. man. Yes, sir. Uh he and I, well, I'm working in this organization right now, Foot Soldiers Journey, and uh we're trying to uh come up with some type of format like you guys are doing. Uh yeah, maybe not as frequent, but uh, so we're trying to uh, come up with some ways to educate some supplemental education, as you mentioned, uh, yes. outside of the classroom. So he's in his early 80s, but he's still sharp, very sharp, <laughs> mentally, uh, still up in Naperville, Illinois. So uh, but we're all from Mississippi. So we're trying to uh, bring some supplemental uh, education back to Mississippi beyond the school, you know, but trying to fight uh, these people like Tate Reeves and. Uh, the governor with that uh, crazy uh, 1776 doctrine is in, in, in you see just that? Yeah. 
Yeah, so yeah, it's hard. Right. You try, uh, fight. First thing you got to do fighting Tate Reeves is to fight him to get that uh, get that synthetic rug off his head and embarrassing himself. But that that would be if we cared enough. Exactly. <laughs> that would be too much work right there. That would be too much work. Too much but, work, brother. He, he, yeah, he's committed. So what, what kind of thing, what kind of format are y'all thinking about? Well, um, he was looking at uh, maybe uh, like a YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, you know, with some of the past because uh, right now he's still going to churches, public libraries, doing speaking engagements. But with COVID, you know, he's really been uh, handcuffed with that. And yeah. so uh, so that's so we're trying to get some type of format that's not as uh, maybe restrictive uh, that can work with along with his schedule. And also with Miss um, Bell, uh, who also was his uh, co-author on the yeah. book. And so, uh, like I said, we're all related. We all traced our roots back to the Armstrong Plantation in in, in Lawrence County at that time. Really? Uh, yeah. So have, have y'all done have y'all done that history? We've done on uh, my paternal side, uh, which we're all from the same tree, but uh, different branches, yeah. so to speak. So the reason, we've gone I ask, back. The reason I ask is because a lot of the work has been my experience that you know, like you say just like this conversation we're beginning to have now, really people who are listening to this are thinking, well, I didn't know any of what you said. Hold hold up uh, the uh, Freedom Writer again, brother. Because y'all need to get that book right there. See, this is, yeah. those cats right there are, I mean, when you start talking about Brother Armstrong, Thomas Armstrong, I'm thinking about his colleagues and comrades. And probably, I don't know if he, uh, you know, Dory Ladner and Joyce Ladner, they out of oh, yeah, uh, Hattiesburg. Yes. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I mean, you need to get that book because that's the kind of first person narrative and experience. Like we're having this conversation. And this is beautiful, but that pulls up alongside it. And then we sit back and start to write down these notes. See, fortunately he's written, but there's some, as you know, better than any of us, there are so many more stories that he ain't even, right. you know, right. we need to surround him with some, some of brother Glenn's students, some of my students. Look, man, let's just get this cat and we can get him once or twice a month just to open right. up a channel and feel questions. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. We're definitely going to talk about it. And uh, I don't know if you guys have ever been to the, uh, the Civil Rights Museum in uh, Jackson. Uh, the one, the new one? The new one. I wasn't uh, able to get down there before this damn thing hit because it's two, yeah. it's right, they two right next to each other, right? Yeah. Exactly. It's two right next to each other. I've have seen you been there? Yeah, I have. I went, uh, when we went to Mississippi, um, oh, it is amazing. And I hear many ways, because I haven't been to the one in DC, that it is better than the one in DC. The curator of that museum took us on a tour and I met uh, so many beautiful people. It was, it was amazing. It is yeah. amazing. If you are in Mississippi, you have to do it. You have yeah. to. Yeah. Because yeah. the, the, the Mississippi Museum goes back to the Native Americans, right? But I'm not yeah. mistaken, about thousands yeah. of years. Yes, the uh, the actual uh, Mississippi M Museum of Art um, is is extraordinary. So if anybody uh, ever goes to downtown Jackson, you know the, the uh, down State Street where the Capitol is, there's a lot of uh, art history down there. They totally remade downtown. So if anybody goes to Jackson, Mississippi. Definitely take a tour downtown uh, around the capital area. So there's a lot of rich history down there. That that uh, Travis, you you just made me. Uh, I'm gonna ask you something right quick, bro. I mean, in terms of this work that you all are building out to create a platform to kind of do things in real time, do you have any folks who you're in conversation with at Tougaloo or Jackson State, or for that matter, Rust or you know Alcorn? I'm just thinking about students who, hearing this, would say, "Oh, we'll help you. We'll do all the tech." <laughs> just turn on the camera. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about the students, particularly in Mississippi, who right. could then broadcast out to the world, but build build out and do all the legwork, because this is something that seems to me that Mississippi students need to be able to hear. And then those college students, particularly those HBCUs, and again, no shade to Felburn. I, you know, I love those kids. In fact, Charles Ross went to grad school and he's at Ole Miss. Um, you know, I get that. But those HBCU college students could then be the bridge between the K-12 students and the elders. Right. I mean, it seems like it's all sitting there waiting for us. <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Armstrong graduated from Tougaloo. Um, ah. And I'm not sure of the connections he still has uh, as far as the newer generations. That's something we're, we're still trying to work on. Oh, you are? Yes, sir. So uh, hopefully we can get 
uh, once, you know, everything kind of quiets down with the pandemic and everything, we can get back. Uh, well, I, dro I dropped my email in the chat because I know that, um, for example, uh, my good friends at Teaching for Change, uh, the Zen Education Pro Project, they do a lot of work. Like before this thing hit, they would meet at Tougaloo. Okay. And uh, what is it called? The, uh, there's another parallel organization. A lot of SNCC veterans, like say, Jory, Dory and Joyce Nems called, is it the Champions for Change? Tougaloo was like one of their bases of operations. And so to me, this just sounds like not even one degree of separation. This is just a matter of us talking and then expanding the network. And before you know it, it's, oh, no, no, tell him to, oh, we've been looking for you. <laughs> I read the book. And next thing you know, all he got to do is just, because a lot of that energy is coming out of Tougaloo. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Sir. I mean, I mean, like, like, like literal programming. And I'm embarrassed to say if you, uh, well, anyway, you, you see, you see my email, man. She, she, me, let, let, let's talk because I want to connect you to the Zen Ed folks and teach it for change. Cause this sounds like something that they would be very interested. And I say they, I mean we, because I say I'm on the board TFC. They invite me to out. It's a real honor. Uh, high school teachers. Uh, uh, in fact, they just did a book called uh, "Black Lives Matter at School." Uh, their mo their their next to most recent publication. I thought I had a copy of it within reach, but I don't see it. Is on Black Lives Matter. Um, uh, Jesse Hagorian, H Hagopian, who is out on the West Coast in Washington State, high school teacher, brilliant educator. They publish a monthly journal. Um, actually, uh, hmm, I'm looking for my copies. It's like anything else with a book. You think it's around and you realize you moved all those books a long time ago. But um, but yeah, we we're gonna let's let's talk shortly and connect this, man. Glad to hear from your cousin, man. Wow. All right. Um, and Travis, drop your email just in case Carl oh, yeah, you, yeah. in the general chat. Cause I can't trust you to not do you that. What I did. I didn't, I didn't, <laughs> I'm following instructions. I can learn. <laughs> All right. So Travis, drop your email and then I'll connect y'all afterwards so that everybody doesn't email Dr. Carr at once. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, and there's something really endearing about you um, not realizing how big this is. You know, and not realizing that, you know, there's a large collective family that is mm -hmm. so intimate that you feel like you were just talking to Travis or Ali and, oh, you know, yeah, individual true. people. And, um, and I mean, it speaks to this family that yes. that's created here. So I, I yeah. feel I feel the intimacy as well. But I'm also mindful yeah, uh, right. that, you know, your time and your energy cannot be bombarded right. with a Gotta lot of reading. Energy. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Travis, oh. he had another. Oh, yo, I'm sorry, Travis. You had another question. My bad. Hold on. Let me he add. Did, yes, yes, we right. just, did he ask? Right. Okay. Okay. In my uh, home county, we have a Rosenwald school. Oh, you do? Yes, sir. And also a normal uh, and industrial school uh, called Prentice Institute. Prentice, yeah. yeah. Yes. Sir. And uh, I wrote uh, my thesis uh, last year on Rosenwald schools from the aspect of uh, black uh, black families contributing. Almost four million dollars over, I think, twenty year period. Um, Travis, you know that story better than I do. That book over your left shoulder, that James Anderson book. Right. When my Howard students found out that why y'all calling them Rosenwald, that's the first question they asked. Why y'all calling them Rosenwald <laughs> schools? The black people raised all the damn money. Exactly. You wrote about that. Exactly. Yes, sir. And you, uh, last week you mentioned about the nineteen oh eight uh, race riots, and that's exactly how Julius Rosenwald got involved with uh, building those Rosenwald schools. Because according to him, he uh, felt bad for black people. And so he uh, collaborated with Booker T. Washington and uh, they built the first school, I believe, in Alabama. Yeah. Around 1912, 1913. So my mother went to one. Yes, sir. And yeah. so uh, hey, what's the book uh, the, the woman wrote called uh, You Need a Schoolhouse? Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. So uh, right now uh, we do. They do have a uh, trustee board trying to keep the Rosenwald bill. It got renovated uh, several years ago. And so, uh, what are they using uh, it as now? Uh, it's like a they have a small museum uh, mm -hmm. in there, and they also use it uh, for like banquets. They have a yearly, uh, matter of fact, in February, I don't know if they're going to have it next year, but they have a uh, in February, they have a um, uh, so called commemoration for it. And they're also the alumni come back, yes, sir. And yeah, one thing about the Southern Negroes, boy, they had them all class reunions in the South. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they don't miss them all class yeah, reunions. Yeah. And, and they're also working on documentary for it. So I don't know when it's coming out. Uh, there was a group out of Los Angeles who actually came to uh, 
uh, do some footage. So, but uh, normally I try to go back to those things, but again, with the pandemic and everything, I haven't been able to do it. So hopefully they'll be coming off the pike and I can let you guys know uh, when that stuff comes out. So I want to read you a thesis, man. I, I'd gladly send it to you. Please. Yeah. They, we just change emails because people, I think we often, this goes for everybody. People, we, the books are important, very important. Now, Scott, but so much of our story is in those theses, yes. even undergraduate theses, but it's particularly those master's theses, PhD uh, documents. Because, I mean, I don't know, have you thought about turning it into a, a, another type of book? I mean, it's already a publication, the thesis, but you thought about publishing it out for a wider audience? Well, I thought about it and I've talked to a couple of, uh, you know, I'm new to this education sure. uh, um, community because, again, I was in the military, so, you know, uh, we did our own different thing, but uh, I have thought about it, but I don't know the avenues to do that, to be honest with you. Well, let's continue to talk as well, because one of the most important things, too, is that uh, academia is like any other hustle. You know, there's a hierarchy, there are gatekeepers, and there's a kind of sense of how to regulate uh, access and entry. We're exploding all that because we ain't going back to the way it used to be. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. So. We have black publishers, we have independent publishers that are black, and we have people who need that information because, I mean, you're actually in your work going through the black people who contributed the money. Is that is that what you saying? Yes. See, that's because I'm like, it, like I say in James Anderson's book, remember in uh i forget what chapter i guess it's a chapter on the rosenwald schools where they in altaga county alabama and then altagaville and the old black lady comes up in the front of the meeting and she says i have one copper cent yeah. and it goes to the children of altagaville yeah. <laughs> they came out of <laughs> cotton fields uh came out of cotton fields just to donate money and go back to work my it was god amazing. it was amazing but, so. see that's why i want to read yours because uh, man that thing sends a shock through me every time i read it but i want to read yours man because you didn't compile the story and it shows our people how to go collect the rest of those stories. I have a very good friend, Jagna mine, Alvin Thornton, who is out of Alabama. He is in the, uh, he, he went to the, uh, oh no, my mother graduated from Russell County, the Rosenwald School there. He, his was, uh, oh, what's the name? It's, it's got the same initials, not Roosevelt County. But anyway, their alumni, put, they, they wrote a book and they're working on a documentary because now these people have discovered these schools, right. they got grants. They got, so we got to, now nah, we need you. We need you to tell a story. We don't need you to share your information with a filmmaker. And then you yeah. get invited to the, you know, to the screening <laughs> right. and talk for five minutes. No, no, we need your <laughs> story. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Got to tell it. Yes, I, uh, I might be able to help. Uh, so oh, drop look, your email. Being modest. That's the one right there. <laughs> <laughs> drop your email in our private chat, not yeah. public. Okay, Travis, and then let's let's figure this oh. out. Okay, we'll do that. Thank you all so much. I appreciate well, it. Thank you all. Oh, thank you, man. Look, look. As as Kevin Durant, Mama said uh, when he said to his mom, "You the real MVP." This is the whole point of this. But like you said, Karen, we just dropping breadcrumbs. Our people's stories with our people. That's what August Wilson is doing. That's why I can't wait to watch. I didn't watch. I watched the first few minutes, but now after this, I'll go back and watch. I wanted to wait until we had our conversation to go back and watch the whole Netflix piece because uh, just the 10 minutes that I watched, you talk about the alchemy in that. Mm. Viola Davis, man, she is no joke. I didn't know how she was going to bring off, you know, after Merritt, you know, Whoopi did a great job, but man, Viola oh, she, Davis. Let me tell you, uh, the end, and, and you inspired me to go back and read the play. So, you got to, yeah, you're, you're going to love it, Karen, because you're going to hear them in your head. It's yeah. nothing like reading and making up the characters in your mind. That Glenn Terman, the leftovers in the in the film, yes, hit me. But the end, because Ma Rainey. Wait you, know, you know, dude, some people ain't seen it. I know, but I'm not going to give it away. But the, okay, okay, I know the, the negotiation of her agency, you know, again, 1927, a black woman, black man, 1927 in America with no voting rights, with no financial, you know, you're either on your knees, working for somebody, cleaning, scrubbing, taking care of their children, or you're on your back, See, you know, as we yeah. saw the, the young lady in there, you know, that you're na navigating your sexuality to mm. find a way to, to live the kind of life you want to live, but you're always compromising. And Ma Rainey figured out how to not compromise. 
and, and understood the power that she held in her art That's and right. was leveraging it to get everything from a Coca-Cola to, you know, everything that she wanted to have. She knew how to le yeah. leverage, leverage that levy, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. as, I, as I think about that. So, you know, well, and not only that, she lived on she only lived until 1939. But here. Oh, wow. Ma Rainey passed away the tw 22nd of December, 1939. So next, you know, wow. coming up next week will be her wow. the day she made. But she left Chicago. Her mother got sick, passed. She went back to Columbus where she was born and ran, owned and operated two theaters in Rome, Georgia. So, so, so in other words, even in my rain, even in my rainy's black bottom, you see that moment, all of what she is, as you say, she brings to bear in that space. But that recording studio was not Ma Rainey's life. That's one reason she wouldn't budge. And when she got tired of that life, the you know the 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 the, the theoretical levy. In other words, I'm going to make this money. Okay, Ma Rainey, like I see y'all. Well, I'm going back to Georgia. I own theaters. <laughs> you understand? Oh, Ma Rainey, no joke. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean you know, and and those of us now in this space in these white facing institutions mm -hmm. that many of us teach in, work through work in, mm -hmm. you know, with bosses and things, you know, to understand what your true power is and your true agency and coming in there, leveraging that. And yeah, they can take away, they could take your music, you know, and give it to somebody else who will record yeah. and make more money off of it. But when you know, like Prince, when you know the value of who you are, Dave Chappelle, right? you know, it changes the, it changes the conversation. Yeah, and I, just, right. you know, if anyone watches this, be inspired by that, that's the goal to have so much agency over the things that you produce that you can leverage them how you need to. And so I'm by you, because you are you naming them, we name you as well, because that's why this space exists and all the spaces that empty into this space and this space is connected to. I want to thank you, Karen, because you're not just talking about it. You're showing us how to do it for us. I'm showing myself. I'm showing no myself. Question. No question. We all show Yeah, yeah. yeah but, you know, sometimes right. it takes somebody at the center of that space. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Let me let me thank you uh, immensely thank you. for your time and, no. and your spirit and all the ancestors that speak through you every single Saturday and beyond. And uh, you are you're amazing. And I want to thank everybody that was in this chat and this uh, and this in this broadcast. I want to thank you for supporting this. We are 2021 going to uh, take this up a notch because you can't be complacent. So be prepared for what's coming next. And I just want to right. say thank you. Yes. Have a oh, one. Thank, thank our brother Mike Harriet. He keeps shouting oh. us out. I see the number of subscribers is gro is growing. Y'all get everybody to subscribe. Karen making a move. You understand? People are starting to respond. So yes, thank you. Thank subscribe, you. Subscribe, like, share, thumbs yes. up, smash yes. the like button. Thank you. Follow him at Africana Car on Twitter. He's responsive. I'm as well at Karen Hunter. I love you. Uh, Merry Christmas, whatever that means to you. Oh yeah, same here. Wait, is that next week? Yes. I love it. See, when yeah. you move time and space around, it don't even matter. We need, look, we might talk about the solstice next week because we know that if Jesus was born and came into existence, it certainly would have been at a moment. Well, anyway, the Egyptians have a whole story about that birth ritual. Well, let's do that yeah. next Saturday. Yeah, the we'll birth, do that. The we'll birth of oh, that'll be fun. Wait. <laughs>